Hallo und herzlich willkommen zu Welcome unseren Audi Media Days. Audi Wir melden uns Media hier Days. direkt von der Audi Piazza, from the Audi zwischen Piazza unserem between our Audi Forum, our Museum Mobile and of course the plant here in Ingolstadt. Now, we've picked this site at the heart of Audi quite deliberate because we want to use the upcoming days to give you the broadest possible insight into our company. Now, it's all about a number of varied questions, current questions that are not keeping only us awake at night, but the entire industry and also society at large. Our answers, the Audi answers, are the ones we will outline to you in the next five days in five different spotlight topics. And today we're starting with corporate and business. That means today we want to use the day to outline the cornerstones of our new strategy 2030 to you. After the show, we've got a Q&A session penciled in, which means you will be able to ask your questions and, of course, go to the microsite where you can send in your questions already as we talk up front. So, that much by the way of introduction. And with that, a handover to our boss, CEO Max Dusman. Welcome to the Audi Media Days. I'm delighted to welcome our guests from around the world to Ingolstadt today. Behind me, you can see the studio on the Audi Piazza, where we intend to take you on a journey through the future of our brand over the coming days. More than ever, we now find ourselves asking, what will the demand for mobility look like in 10 years? How will the legal framework have changed in the meantime? Our role and our responsibility is to anticipate these developments and make the right decisions now. We want to harness our innovative strength so that we can offer people sustainable, carbon-neutral mobility options. My colleagues on the board of management and I have intensively addressed the question of how to position Audi for the future. We're transforming Audi in a number of respects, not least in terms of drive systems. 2025 will see the launch of our final new model for the global market with an internal combustion engine. And production of combustion engines will end for good in 2033. In other words, around 12 years from now, our portfolio will be all electric. It goes without saying that this represents a huge change for our entire company. But I believe it is an even bigger opportunity. Although we have no other choice, we're acting out of conviction. We want to be at the forefront of this movement and to reinvigorate our promise of Vorsprung durch Technik. And we will continue on this path with absolute commitment. We chose to take the necessary time to work on our strategic realignment. And in developing this strategy, we decided to take a new approach by regularly consulting numerous employees from every level of the hierarchy, right from the start. After all, our strategy will only succeed if it enjoys the support of the whole Audi team. Although 2030 is still far away, we're already absolutely clear as to what our plan from now until then entails. Over the coming days, we will tell you more about what we're already doing now to ensure our success in the future. Innovation management, digital production, outstanding electric models, our vision of the future world of work, 5G, and how we're making our supply chains sustainable. These are just some of the topics we will be discussing in the days ahead. And I hope to see you again in the studio behind me on September 1st for a press conference that will feature a very special premiere. Until then, all the best. Well then, and with that, we're back here with our first round of talks. And I can welcome Sylvia P, Chief Strategy Officer, John Newman, our Head of Digitalization, and Martin Prumus, General Secretary for Corporate Strategy. Good to have you here. I know your schedules are pretty busy, but let's start straight away with a question which is rather simple, really, but one that I've encountered quite often. Now that we've communicated the first cornerstones of the new strategy, Vorsprung 2030, I mean, only two years ago we communicated the last strategy, now, once again, why do we need a new strategy? 
Well, that's a great question. But at the end, we all know that the world is changing ever faster and we need to adapt to that. That is why we really took time and analyzed more than 600 trends. And we took them not only from Europe, but from all across the globe. We put a focus on the development in China and the US. And we analyzed trends and they gave us very clear tendencies. Sustainability is growing in importance for our customers. But also, the individual mobility is also very important for our customers. And that means for a new strategy for Audi, that's very important. Also, we have changes in regulatory framework. On the one hand, the new Green Deal in Europe, but also the new Biden administration. They've put a focus on climate protection. These are all aspects that we've now put into a new strategic alignment. And that was a reason for us to say, right, we're going to have to change our strategy. To you, in the last few months, what was important for you the last few months? Well, as Celia just outlined, we spent these last months to address in depth the questions and issues here and have really taken the strategy to interplay within the strategy of the Volkswagen Group. Now, particularly important for us was that we have a common shared set of objectives that was clearly defined where we want to be in 2030 and to this end we have certainly very ambitious targets that also give us a clear orientation on what we want to focus and concentrate on and what we will omit doing in future because our future is clearly electric autonomous sustainable and digital and to do so we even go as far as to say that our customers will in future become users of our products and services I know you spent quite some time in the Silicon Valley and you know, maybe not all, but a lot about the, the, the speed there, the, the scalability of new um, um, digital, digital uh, business models and all that. How we are prepared for that? Yeah, that's a good question. So on two sides, on the speed first, um, we're looking at a couple different things. Uh, first, our strategy really focuses um, on using the equipment, on the technology that we have today uh, to get into the market quickly. Uh, also, um, we're co-developing our products with our customers, and so that allows us to get into the market, hopefully with better product market fit and thus make speed. Um, and then in a third dimension, we're also looking at building a software that uh, satisfies multiple use cases. And so this means that we don't have to deliver things one at a time. And then on the scalability point that you mentioned, we're really now focused on introducing solutions that we can introduce across multiple platforms. And so this gives us access to millions and ultimately 10 million vehicles at once. And so hopefully that uh, allows us uh, to take full advantage of the digital opportunity uh, for, for our strategy. Yeah. And what does that mean for, for our existing business model? Yeah, so two, two things. Um, first, it really causes us to focus very clearly um, on business that happens after we sell the vehicles. And so this is a bit of a change. Um, and then as Martin and others have mentioned, um, we also think increasingly about users and not just customers. Um, and so that's a, a second key attribute of our, our digitalization uh, strategy and the overall corporate strategy. Mm -hmm. Um, See, so yeah, the last decades we've been quite successful actually in developing, producing and selling cars, above all of course with combustion engines. But now we're shifting to electric mobility and to new business models and other things. And as you said earlier, of course, we also have the influence from the various international aspects. How did you manage in the development of the strategy? How did you consider this? Right. So when developing our strategy, we actually went down a new path. This strategy was completely developed in-house. We'd never done that before. We also took on board a lot of people from our... So there was a strategic top in the board of management withdraw from that? No? Exactly. So we really tried to make the most of the expertise that we already have in our company today. We had a team called Audi 500 Plus. 500 Plus because we actually had more than 500 employees and colleagues from all regions, also from the US and China. 
We, of course, also had European sites involved. Half of them actually were tariff workers, so we really had a broad base for this strategy. We wanted to use the expertise at Audi today already, but also we wanted to give our colleagues the opportunity to co-create the future of our company. And we think that holds the promise that we'll have a broader base and more acceptance when the strategy is implemented. Because on the one hand, we'll have the knowledge, where do we want to go? But we also know that we've already asked our colleagues and they were able to have a say. So we believe that this is a strategy that's coming from the company for our company. So that is really the best to go forward. Now, if we look at these dominating topics here, I mean, it's electrification, it's sustainability, it's digitization. I mean, this is something that doesn't only hold true for us, but this is, I mean, all around the industry and probably also outside our industry is equally important. We know that actually. Now, how do we set ourselves apart from that? I believe we really made this decision very early on, especially when it comes to discontinuing the internal combustion engine. We put a focus on electrification. Starting in 2026, we will only launch fully electric models on the world market. As a consequence, that means that starting in 2033, we will discontinue the manufacturing of our combustion engines. Of course, we'll always have to keep in mind that there are regional differences. In China, for example, it may be possible that we'll have a different offer for a longer time. But in general, there's a clear path forward. And this clarity gives us the possibility to really prepare for the transformation ahead and really focus. Um. Now, I think in that list, there was one aspect that I was omitted, I'm omitted, and that's, of course, software and operating systems. Yes, of course, that is another very important aspect, next to electric mobility. Digital prerequisites are significant. I believe that in our group and in our business, we have synergies that we can benefit from. Of course, we also profit or benefit from Carriot, and they have a software alliance built only recently. We also have the electric platform that we can benefit from, and that's great for Audi. Also, autonomous driving, using or making prerequisites that starting in 2025, we can actually launch these models. I believe that we can really use the group synergies. And I believe that also helps us when it comes to the launching speed, but also when it comes to scale effects. Speaking of software, I know you like uh, the term user instead of customer. Why is that? Well, I think uh, the two trends that are very important for us to keep in mind as we look to the future. Uh, first, um, the trend around highly automated driving frees up time inside the vehicle. And that creates new users of our products. Um, and second, mobility creates uh, opportunities to bring additional people into our vehicles, and that creates users. Um, so that's why it's an important term, but also I think it transcends uh, the relationship that we have and the potential we can have with the people that are uh, associated with our vehicles and start thinking about new products and new services, digital uh, products and services. Um, and so for me, that's a very exciting opportunity for Audi to explore, and I think one where we have ability to to differentiate versus some of the um, well-known Silicon Valley players because we can integrate those products and services with the vehicle, mm -hmm. which is not easily done by some of the other competitors. Thanks. Um, Martin, jetzt geht well, es Martin, ja um Umsetzung der Strategie. it's all a matter now of implementing the strategy. strategy. What are the next steps here? Well, the basis for a successful strategy is, of course, a solid foundation. A solid foundation that allows us the implementation, or even better, that actively supports its implementation. And to this end, we've defined three pillars for ourselves and thrashed them out in crunky detail. It's a strong financial performance with a long-term operative return of over 11%, as well as other key financial parameters and, of course, other ambitious KPIs. Secondly, it's the workforce. It's the workforce that we need to have systematically trained for that transformation, as well as for the day-to-day -day further development of our corporate culture. And last but not least, it is our strong corporate management. If I may just add here, corporate management, can you, can you thrash that out in more detail? Sure. Corporate management has also been further optimized, reworked, modified in the last few months, and also made it future-ready. 
And to this end, we've defined clear responsibilities, clear lines of hierarchy and reporting, making it clear what's important for the strategic level as well as for the management and the operative implementation level. And that gives us an excellent framework from which the strategy can be implemented, pinpointed. And in summary, you can say that with the strategy, we really have developed the qualifying for the future and have really mastered that quite well. And now it's all about, well, taking that implementation of the strategy and, of course, being consistent in driving that implementation forward, but also getting our homework right, which we have done, and we're now starting well prepared into that race. So from a pole position, I would say, I think that's a pretty good wrap-up to that. Thanks, Celia. Thanks, John. Thanks, Martin. Now, Celia and John will see each other later in the Q&A session. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure now to take you along into our R&D department, where we will follow up the question, how will Audi make sure in future that innovations will be the key lever for the company? Following that, we will have a chat with our CFO, Jürgen Rittersberger, our Finance and Legal Affairs board member, so that we also see the financial side of Vorsprung. Okay. We see Vorsprung durch Technik as an aspiration and a state of mind. It inspires us to give our all, push the boundaries of what is achievable, and continuously get better at what we do. Audi stands for passion and a pioneering spirit. For a belief in consistently challenging the status quo. Vorsprung durch Technik is more than just a claim. Vorsprung durch Technik is a promise. In the era of new mobility, it is more than just a technical promise. We're giving it a far broader definition. Vorsprung is our aspiration to make a significant contribution to the development of society. Ideas are the key. New ideas are the only way for Audi to continuously bring innovative developments to the market, especially ideas that appear unconventional at first glance. These ideas originate in the heads of our more than 10,000 developers. But to turn an idea into an innovation that our customers will get to experience in their vehicles and in our products, professional processes are what are needed. And these processes have changed significantly. The vehicle used to be the sum of its components. Today, we think in terms of highly connected software-based systems. These processes are agile and quick. So they require an entirely different kind of development. We take a holistic view of the vehicle and the functions our customers will experience. We embody Vorsprung in everything we do. I believe that's something you can feel and something that can also be seen in our vehicles. Well, that was quite impressive, I must say. Audi has brought plenty of innovations to market, but still, of course, there's still a few challenges ahead of us. One of them, for example, speed. Now, We'll come to what is almost a logical next question that beckons itself. Namely, how does Audi want and can finance all of this? And of course, this is something that also needs to be sustainable. And to this end, I've got Jürgen Rittersberger, a member of board for finance and legal affairs with me. Now, you've been with us for the 1st of April and welcome. So let me start with a very simple question. What does Audi have to do in order to still do justice to Vorsprung der Technik? Well, look, I'm fully agreed with Oli Hoffmann, my colleague on the board. It's all a matter of speed. We need to get our innovations quickly realized, especially in this dynamic environment in which we are at home. Here, we need to drive innovations at great speed forward to keep a competitive edge. But it's not just technologies, also social and societal issues need to keep in focus with our technology. We as a company have a social responsibility which we take very serious. And at the end of the day, this is something that's also evident in our strategy. We want to bring meaningful 
technologies and innovations in order to keep our company and our environment moving forward and to actually keep them abreast. So that's a holistic approach, isn't it? Indeed, it is a holistic approach. We need to think holistically because at the end of the day, behind every innovation, there is an attitude. And that's also the approach of ESG, as it's called, that acronym. One of the key strategic components within the Forschung 2030 strategy. And it's a component for which you, as a board member, now sign responsible. Maybe just to explain ESG, though I think it is known to most of you. Still, E stands for environment, starts from sustainability in the product development and the product itself, also in the supply chain. S stands for social, and it's not just the classic um, CSR issues, corporate social responsibility, but it's also product safety, for example, or our responsibility towards our employees. And G, at the end, stands for governance. All the issues of corporate management, decision-making processes in the company, compliance with laws and regulations, diversity and the likes. Now, what does ESG mean for you? Well, first of all, I'm delighted to be responsible for that component, the ESG component, because in my work, ESG has always played an important role. I am convinced that we as a company have put ESG strongly and must put it center stage, because at the end of the day, we as a company have a huge responsibility for society, and we must take good care that ESG in all our decisions, in all our processes, plays a vital role. That's the the only way that we will manage, that we will also make a contribution towards our world, remaining worth living in. Now, there's no need to for the world, i.e. our customers, but also or for the capital markets, isn't that right? Indeed. Especially in the last few years, ESG has become more and more important at the capital markets. Our investors and the capital markets themselves are putting ESG more and more into focus of their reviews and investment decisions. That means, at the end of the day, capital markets value, appreciate ESG criteria to assess our going concern in future, our future readiness, our license to operate, as I say, our justification to be. Now, with a strategy, we've defined the guidelines, I would say, for the whole ESG component. How are we integrating, how are we anchoring these claims from ESG in the company? Well, see, as I just said, ESG is one key issue, and we need to anchor it in our processes, in our corporate decisions, in all our products, in all our services. To this end, we at Audi have already defined clear sustainability targets for us, which we now, as part of our strategic work, will have to be resharpened. And of course, we will also take these strategic objectives and targets, make them transparent, measurable and sustainable. That's the only way that we can manage to really anchor the sustainability targets in the company. What's the concrete measures you're taking? Well, what we are doing is that in our decision-making processes, in our core procedures, in our product decisions, ESG will have a top priority. And with that, of course, at the end of the day, everything we do can be metered and gauged against the ESG criteria. So it's not just financial KPIs, it's also about issues such as climate change, environmental protection, ethic corporate management, social action, compliance, integrity, or culture and diversity and the likes. So you can see many of these issues which we subsume under ESG are at the end of the day a central part and parcel of our corporate decisions and our corporate governance. And how, how do we create transparency? How do we make this comprehensible? Well, we'll make it measurable. To this end, we will subject ourselves to an ESG rating. And that means that also makes us comparable on an international scale. We're giving ourselves a standard on which basis we'll define our targets. And of course, we will also create transparency. We will report, we will communicate what we're doing. I mean, this year, our financial reporting has been amalgamated in the reporting with our sustainability actions and activities as part of the ESG criteria. I've spelled this through. That requires a few investments, doesn't it? I mean, investments that you need to be able to afford in the first place. So how can and how do we want to afford all this? 
You're right. These investments are the ones we need to master. And especially when you look at the transformation in which Audi is right in the, in the entire automotive industry, these investments are considerable. So what we need to manage is we need to create the leeway, the free space for these investments in future. We have to find them and we have to generate them ourselves. Now, for me as a CFO, that means we have to define clear and set clear priorities. And we have to be consistent and work in our cost structure on our processes. Any concrete measures? Well, indeed, for example, an earning oriented volume management central topic, meaning we need the right models in the right markets and that, of course, also very much geared by the earning contribution of each vehicle. To this end, we need a flexible production. And what's more, we are working flat out to improve our operative performance. That means, for example, a very deliberate and a very cautious handling of our capex, meaning also remaining a competitive fixed cost basis, which means, for example, we've got two programs, Audi Transformation Plan and the Audi Zukunft Plan. In the ATP, for example, we have, for example, already found a volume of 8 billion euros that we released at our target, is 15 billion euros that we want to release. With the Audi Zukunft program, we are driving and managing a transformation of our personnel resources. Now, one thing, however, we will certainly make no savings on, that's our product lineup, because that's our future readiness. And to this end, our R&D budget in the last few months has actually gone up. Ah, that's why Oli Hoffman was so cheery in that interview earlier. Now, an important aspect in the strategy is, of course, the usage of group synergies utilization of this industry. What, which are we talking about? Well, especially with the new transformation issues like electrification, connectivity, digitization, autonomous driving. Here we are talking about the synergies that we need to lift afforded us by the Volkswagen Group. We have to bundle our forces. With Carrier, for example, we have developed software a new and together, and we're using the synergies that we can find within the group quite consistently. That allows us, for example, to reap new earning potential that we see in the software area and to also utilize that potential. And we've got issues here already on the way where we can make our customers a good offer. And we saw that in the video just there. And then we've got Artemis, haven't we? <laughs> That's a very good example. Yes, Artemis. Artemis is a good example in case. It is our lighthouse project with which we will bring the new technologies in a highly efficient, fully electric, fully connected vehicle, which we will bring to market by 2025. And with that, we will redefine the luxury class. And I think Artemis is a good example for the new platform strategy within the group, that we once more will reduce the number of platforms, which of course also will create new financial leeway. Indeed. I mean, the platform strategy is something we've been using in the group for a long, long time. On the one hand, the platform strategy gives us that leeway, that free Way that the brands can have the individual freedom to stand alone, so to say, but also the platform strategy allows us to reap the synergies that I just mentioned. That means a platform strategy is a strong element. When it comes to electrification and digitization, of course, we now have potential and opportunities that platforms afford us and we'll ramp them up still further and we can use them even more. Also for our brand group? Indeed, indeed, the brand group, which, by the way, since the 1st of March now includes also Bentley. And Bentley, I mean, will now be integrated within our brand group. That means we can also have the synergies of electrification used much better. Or another good example is, I mean, our premium platform, electric, the PPE platform. That's one that we will also be using in China in future. Well, electrification in China, that's a good keyword. And because we have now next Werner Eichen, our CEO for Audi China, here lined up, and he will give us an insight into one of our most important markets, namely in China. You're only successful if you understand and anticipate specific local customer needs and if you implement them in your products. Now, Audi is recognized as early on. With the Audi A6L, we actually were the first manufacturer to offer a premium saloon with an extended wheelbase in China. And we constantly expanded our model lineup in China, from 10 models in 2008 to over 40 at the end of this year. Now, the four rings enjoy an excellent reputation in China. With 727,000 vehicles in 2020, we achieved a record result despite difficult global conditions.
And in the first half of 2021, we can also see a new record being set, with 418,000 Audi models sold so far. But the basis for our future growth is our two-partner strategy. Together with our new partner Saic and our long-standing partner FAW, we are setting completely new standards as a premium manufacturer. At the Shanghai Auto Show in April, we gave a preview of our model initiative in China with four vehicle premieres. At the end of this year, we will unveil up to 30 new or revised models in China with our partner FAW. We expect the Chinese premium market to grow to around 4.5 million units by 2030. Of these, up to 40% could then be electric vehicles. In China, for China. This also applies to R&D. To this end, we are stepping up our local development activities. And in doing so, we are cooperating both with our group-wide software and electronic hub, Carriot, as well as with leading Chinese tech giants such as Tencent, Alibaba and Baidu. In China, for China. This also is true for the development of an Audi ecosystem. We will continue to expand the Audi ecosystem. It includes integrating popular Chinese apps into our cars and intelligently connecting our vehicles with the infrastructure. Dr. Dies, for China, the group's second home market. And Audi has internalized this idea. In future, we want to offer our users a dynamic ecosystem around the brand where customers and brand experience will merge into a lifestyle. This is one of the essential tasks for the future, to create an extraordinary attitude to life for the customer with products and experiences around the brand. More than 7 million cars sold in the last 30 years are a great success for four rings in China. And at the same time, it's an incentive to keep inspiring our customers with innovative products and to develop new car-related services. In this sense, stay connected. Well, and with that, we're back from China here in Ingolstadt, where, well, in August, we've just been caught up by April weather after the short shower here. Well, Jürgen, over to you again. Now, if you take that view of China, what will we have to focus more on in the future? Well, I think Werner Eichhorn has just said so. Our customers in China have different requirements and expectations when it comes to mobility than we in Europe. And our customers in Europe have once again different expectations to mobility from our customers in the United States. So for us as an international automotive group, with sites in almost all continents, that means we need to get ready for that. We need to learn from our customers. We need to have our customers clearly in focus, customer-centric. Uh, we already heard a number of times today the word speed, and China can be setting the pace here, no? Indeed, China for me is the trailblazer and it's the clear example why we need a high innovation speed, why we need swiftness in our innovations. Now with the strategy, we readied ourselves for this and we are prepared that with our strategy, we will take the next growth step also in China, especially of course with our electrification strategy. And we have got dedicated teams on site? Yes, of course. I mean, China is in many areas setting the technological pace in that eco environment. And we need to have market-specific innovations that ready ourselves for this. That means we need to understand the customers on site, which we can only do if we've got strong, dedicated regional teams on site. And that's why we are, for example, expanding our R&D developments in China. So in China, for China. Indeed, in China, for China, but of course also China as a pace setter for the development processes here in Europe and the world. Now, China is also well known to be um, a trailblazer when it comes to digital business models. Which role are these digital business models playing when it comes in to sustainable mobility? Well, the digital business models need to be integrated still further with mobility and the new mobility offers. This is the only way that we can manage to have sustainable mobility easier to be used 
by the user and customer, and that's more attractive. What this is all about is the ecosystem around surrounding the electric, fully autonomous driven cars. I think that will be the key to have customer satisfaction, and at the end of the day, with that also, I mean, to retain customers over the long term. Well, John said in that talk earlier that he rather speaks about users than customers. Indeed, indeed, our new business models will be much more software-focused and software-centered, and I think therefore it's right to speak more about users in future. And I mean, that's software slang, isn't it, then to speak of our classic car customer. With the new business models, we started a few things already, like functions on demand. Yes, functions on demand is a very good example for new business potential that we see coming, of course, from the software-driven units. With functions on demand and with the Mao Adiap, for example, you can now have our cars actually really connected to the everyday use of the customer and offer our customers an even better service and increase the comfort for them. I mean, it's it's a great solution, I'd say. And what's more, you can even add options, vehicle options, during the use phase for the user. So he can pick and choose new features during the life cycle of the car. And that means, of course, we can be much more bespoke. It's another potential for revenue. Indeed, indeed. I mean, software, as I said, offers new earnings potential. But of course, we've got other topics also in the pipeline. We are working, for example, on a mobility app, a mobility app that allows the user in a playful way to understand its mobility behavior better. And with that, we are making a contribution towards sustainable mobility and thus to our ESG topic that we addressed earlier. That's the think tank? Yes, indeed. That's our Audi think tank in Berlin. And I mean, the Audi think tank in Berlin is working for us on new creative business models that are digitized. And for this, I mean, the startup environment of Berlin is, of course, ideally suited. I'd like to come back once more to electric mobility, our e-offensive where we are now actually taking almost, well, we're doubling our product lineup in the next few years. And I mean, this entire transformation issue is, of course, a huge, a massive topic for the industry. Now, how can a CFO here push sustainable mobility in that? Well, look, the fact is that at the end of the day, it's the customers who take that decision. They decide how they understand sustainable mobility. Now, in the first half of this year, we've clocked up a new record when it comes to deliveries. And in many, many reasons, we're already back on a pre-crisis level, even exceeded it. So great performance we see here. But electromobility was an important driver in this development. So I'm convinced that with our product offensive, we are on the right way here. We are... Uh, I think we are as consistent as no other in the automotive industry counting on electrification. By 2025, we will have the production of the last combustion engine. We will produce our last combustion engine by 2025, so that by 2026, we will then see the rollout into the markets of that last combustion engine. And then as of 2026, we will produce exclusively battery electric vehicles, bring them to the world markets. And as of 2033, that will be the phase out. That's the end. Yes, that will be the end of the IC. Uh, we're right in the midst of that transformation with the e-tron, the e-tron DT, the Q4 e-tron and the likes. We have already quite a few uh, models at the start. Now, the shift from combustion engine to electric mobility, how can you make that profitable? Well, our strategy here has, of course, first defined the guidelines for our product lineup. Now, from my perspective, that's a central component that we take the right product decisions, that we've taken them. Then, of course, we have to work on the profitability and the economic feasibility of the vehicles. But here we are on, a, on the right track. But with the electric vehicles, we still have a bit of homework to do. That's right. So the profitability of the electric vehicles will definitely be increased in the upcoming years, and we will do so. So that we expect that in two to three years' time, the profitability of an electric vehicle will be roughly on a par of a combustion engine vehicle. And we've got good examples actually already here. If you only look at the Q4 e-tron family in Europe, it already has a comparable margin level as the Q3 family worldwide. And of course, we are really bringing emotional, great products to market over the next few years. So that for me, I mean, 
look, look at the Itron GT. It's a super, super sassy, highly emotional product that clearly shows electromobility can be very emotional. And how do we want to set ourselves apart from the competitors who, of course, are also bringing plenty of marks on the market? Well, I'd say we can count on our traditional strengths, like quality, like design. Here we have the possibility to really set ourselves apart from the competitive field. Look at workmanship, look at color and trim, look at acoustics. These are all our strengths where we can really set ourselves. That's where we can play our strengths. At the end, just one question to you, a personal one. You've been on board for, what is it, six months? What's your, what's your conclusion? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm really I'm thrilled to be part of the Audi team because for me, Audi is the most exciting brand in the Volkswagen Group. Audi has the broadest product lineup and Audi has a very central role to play in the vital future-ready topics. And we are, we are a trailblazer in many issues like electrification, like digitization. And also, when you look, I mean, at the brand group premium with Lamborghini, with Ducati, and now since the 1st of March, Bentley, we have a huge responsibility within the Volkswagen Group. And of course, Ducati, I mean, I'm a, I'm a biker, I'm a, I'm a passionate biker. I love Ducati. I mean, and I do look forward especially to have that brand also under my auspices and under my responsibility. So, some total, I can only say, great. Super to be on board, super to be a part of the Audi team. Jürgen, thank you very much. And as far as bikes are concerned, you're fully with me. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd say, especially the financial aspect of the strategy has, I think, made it quite clear that the entire transformation process is highly complex with us at Audi. But now, we'll move on to the last part of our show, that's the Q&A session. To this end, give us a few minutes to have the participants rejoin us here in the studio, and we'll be back in a few seconds. Stay tuned. Hello and herzlich willkommen. Hello and welcome. These are the Audi Media Days. And I'm delighted to know that you have hooked on and are with us here. Of course, you may have been with us already yesterday when it was all about corporate and business on day one. And today, the spotlight is on digitalization. A very important topic for us, probably also for you in your industry. Transformation is, of course, the catchphrase of the moment, and we've got exciting topics in store for you. It's all about digital business models, sales models, new business models that are digitized, the connected car, and the digitalization of production and logistics. But we don't just want to talk with ourselves, we also look forward to the exchange with you. So, it's a matter of talking in the Q&A session with you. Well, of course, you can send any questions as we talk already by using the chat function on the corresponding microsite. So, that is actually something we really look forward to. But all in all, we want to spend the day to prove to you what we're working on, what we're planning, what we've got in store, what we're already offering as we speak. We want to prove to you that we at Audi are future ready. And uh, we here at Audi have plenty of progress ongoing. And that is exactly what our board member for sales and marketing, Hildegard Botman, will open up the show. So, Hildegard, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Wolfgang. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. The automotive industry is currently experiencing the largest transformation in its history, and the key drivers are electrification and digitalization. We at Audi see it as an opportunity and want to position ourselves at the forefront of this change. We have a chance now to rethink the car entirely. Thanks to digitalization, mobility is becoming just as simple, flexible, individual and interconnected as my smartphone. Today, services and features from Audi are already ensuring that the car integrates seamlessly into this digital life of our customers. But it is no longer only a question of getting from A to B. It is about more than that. The car is becoming a personal experience device in which living space and working space merge. Fully electric, empathetic, intelligent, 
up-to-date and secure. The digitalization of the entire customer journey is becoming a USP, a differentiator. Just as it feels like we have our entire life on our smartphone today, tomorrow we will also have it in our Audi Experience device. And we will experience and use it in a completely new way. Watching films, immersing ourselves in video games, working through emails, using social media and keeping an eye on our health. All of that is coming. It will be immersive and fascinating and above all, it will give you time, the most precious commodity. Time that you can use in a completely different way. Mobility providers like us are universal service providers that facilitate these freedoms, these personal freedoms. Because today, customers are excited by experiences, not just by technology. And that is how we create a unique, high-class experience for our customers. And it is a matter of a seamless and intuitive customer journey. We are making buying all products and services a consistent and emotive premium brand experience through all touch points and stages of sale, as well as in the markets. And to do so, we have reorganized ourselves extensively and continue to focus on software and IT. In digital sales, we are already progress. If a potential customer is interested in an Audi, we are also using virtual consultation and service offerings. To sell an Audi, we follow an integrated, premium, omni-channel approach. We want to create a central e-commerce platform that incorporates all the services that customers are looking for. When it comes to using an Audi, the My Audi app is the key for the digitally connected world of the four rings. Our functions on demand offering is also an example of digitalization. This allows you to register additional equipment features or services in the vehicle, online and also after buying the vehicle. Our customers and also their consultants in the dealerships can use this to respond flexibly to different requirements. Because unlike purely online brands, we combine the strengths of online sales with those of bricks and mortar business. For me, this is human centricity. Whether online or offline, only you decide where and how you want to communicate with Audi. We offer all options for doing so. And update by update, we continue to build on this progress and we are expanding our ecosystem with international partners that generate the greatest added value for our customers. Ladies and gentlemen, future is an attitude. an attitude. We at Audi have the right attitude, a clear vision, and we are already acting today. Our customers experience that whenever they are in contact with Audi, online, at our dealerships, and especially in their own Audi vehicles. With electrification, we are already demonstrating our transformational power. Extensive digital networking and our software development are now generating even more speed. As a result, we are also accelerating the development of autonomous driving, the next major game changer for mobility. Here too, we are already making headway very quickly. Ladies and gentlemen, get ready to be surprised. We are progress, because the future is now. Well, thanks, Hildegard. Maybe you already have first inspiration here for your questions, so don't hesitate to send them in via the microsand by using the chat function. But now, first of all, we'll like to collect you and show you what we are at Audi doing. And now we're talking about the digital customer journey with Boris Miners, who's our head of the digital business portfolio, and Andreas Sichineder, he is CEO of the Audi Business Innovation. So. We just call it the AB at Audi. Now, Boris, Hildegard just gave us here an overview, and we heard from her that digitalization is more or less going to become a USP. What, what does that mean to you? Well, let's take digitalization and, of course, electrification. I mean, these are the two drivers of the transformation in the automotive industry. It facilitates us to think the car completely anew. And digitalization affects all parts of the car, i.e. the product. But on the other hand, of course, also how our customers, when they are in touch with us, with our brand, in every contact point, in their first interest, right through to the usage of the car and services. 
Well, look, we're here in a huge transformation process, Andy. I mean, you've been outsourced in a way, but you're like a, you're a speedboat from Audi, and you've got a very specific challenge ahead of you when it comes to the digitalization. Indeed, indeed. We are really right bang in the transformation process. I mean, it's the change between the physical world, where the customer sets foot in the dealership, has a look at the product, and the digital world. We are convinced that the digital services, bookable functions, for example, in the combination of a vehicle and the ecosystem will be super central for the success and therefore for the mobility of the future. What's more, of course, we are in the step or taking a step towards electric mobility, that is battery electric powered vehicles. And that means, of course, here the requirements of the ecosystem are becoming more and more central and therefore all taking center stage. Ah, now these challenges are for us, of course, global. I mean, Boris, you've just come back from a longer stint uh, secondment in China. But tell us, what, what's the importance digitalization has in China, which is, of course, our biggest market, no? Indeed. What I experienced in China is that the requirements to digitally connected cars in China are completely different. They are much, much higher. And that's why we already today, as Audi, are offering in China functions such as, for example, if you go for a petrol refuel or parking space, all of that can be done completely touchless for the paying process. So these applications are completely seamless, contactless. You don't have to set foot out of the car, you don't have to lower the window. You just go in and go out, and it's easy, it's smooth, and it's seamless. Ah, mm -hmm. But of course, it's not just a matter of pure driving and the experience on board. But what we want to do is to have the entire process digitalized from the first interest in an Audi car, maybe right through to buying a new car. Exactly, that's right. And that's why we at Audi are looking at the entire customer journey. And you just mentioned it yourself, from the first contact right through to the purchase and the usage. And of course, at the end, they need the, the resale of the car, maybe then the new purchase of an Audi. So against this background, we have split up the journey into four phases. We call it I consider, I choose, I use, and I reconsider. And within these four phases, we have, well, the, the, our planning is in such a way that both can be done online and offline at any time you can have an offer from Audi as a customer. And the customer can then choose from their own personal journey when and where they want to do something digitally, online or offline, when they go, for example, to the dealer and when they use, want to use these offers. So that's the choice of the customer, which is important for us. Wow, that is fascinating. I mean, just recently, we never thought that meetings would only be conducted online. But today, it's, it's a standard fare, isn't it? And of course, in the corona pandemic, we've learned an enormous lot. So what could you deduce from that? That's a good point that you make there, Wolfgang. I mean, in the past, customers had their entire journey. If they wanted to buy a car, they would go to the dealer. That's no longer the case as we speak. Of course, accelerated by the pandemic. But what we know today is that 98% of our customers, before they ever set foot in a dealership, have received digital information up front. They've looked at the cars configured them up front and already have deep knowledge of the cars before they see it in the dealership. We supplement this with further digital solutions such as the Audi Life consultation, where the customer can sit quite comfortably at home on this easy chair, like we are here in the lounge, and is in touch with the dealership, and then gets a consultation advice without having to set foot outside his own comfort zone. Should he have an underless in that journey decide, no, he wants to go to a dealer, then we will support him there with further digital formats and modules like, for example, well, high resolution and premium appropriate 3D visualizations of the cars so that every conceivable opportunity and possibility of the cars we can offer can be shown and demonstrated to the customer. Now, in every online configuration that the customer does, he has the, the possibility to well download a code, then upload that code in the dealership and continue in his configuration and also change, for example, to an online and offline consultation. And of course, he also can book a, a test drive online. So it's super easy, super straightforward to experience the car. Yeah. We, in Munich, for example, we're working in making the customer journey more more and more digitally expanded, also more seamless. And that means the ecosystem will be further expanded as we go along. Interesting. I mean, that's probably new for many in Europe, but in China, this is, I mean, this is everyday fare already. So how does this digital journey continue, Andy? I mean, if the 
customer decides to buy an Audi digitally. Well, principally speaking, we know and we notice, of course, that the wish for digitalization when buying a car becomes ever more prominent. Customers want to receive upfront information. And I mean, before you actually buy, is already very digital. And you can, for example, receive online leasing offers, you can make online queries, how do you finance the car? That's something that's very much now anchored online on the internet. It's always available, wherever you are, at any time. And that's exactly what makes the thing so smooth, seamless and so wonderful for the customer. Correct. And of course, the technological solutions that we at RBR are building will be further expanded together with the dealers, will be rolled out still further together with our dealership network and bring them to the world. While, as we speak already, of course, we've got plenty of e-commerce offers which are live in many markets as we speak for new vehicles, for those on inventory or for used cars. Now, nonetheless, let us just briefly take another look at the phase where the customer will actually sit in the car physically. Because, of course, I mean, this is which you will also, when you test the cars, you want to experience the tangible experience, or if you decide to go for an Audi yourself. What use opportunities has the Audi driver got here? But I think the, the My Audi app is, I think, a central element here. That is, shall we say, the, the, the ingress, the access route. I mean, how he can receive information about the car, the data, or his personal data can, of course, also be stored and administered. Moreover, I mean, the services become more and more personalized, individualized, so in the My Audi app, you will have the possibility to book individual services on top. So it becomes more and more customer-oriented, and of course, the access to the car is super easy. That is the My Audi app. I mean, everybody has to understand, I mean, every customer is different, isn't he? Right, right, you're quite right there. And that's why we put so much effort onto the personalization in the digitalization, which means here we are trying to make sure that we've got the right service, the right offer for the customer at every time where he needs it. And that, of course, will become ever more important as we go forward. So the claim of this event is to be future ready, meaning we're already looking at the digital customer journey of tomorrow. And I mean, Boris, you and your team are working on this. Can you already tell us a little, <laughs> look, take a look at the crystal ball? Well, what we're doing today is already of, well, looking more and more at the various customer contact points which each user or customer has with us to harmonize them, to bring them to a uniform approach so that the customers can have a very intuitive and very personal approach and can be rooted thus through the mobility world at Audi. Because at the end of the day, for us, it's a matter of offering a consistent premium experience that is unmistakably Audi, and which of course also, well, brings the brand um, experience well at the digital touch points. That's the one thing, and of course the other thing is that as we already mentioned earlier, we look at the entire journey, and we want to make the entire business models digital, and also, well, we'll set up new digital business models, and at the end of the day, we'll then use these digital technologies in the sales unit, in the after sales, and in the marketing department. I think what's important here, Boris, is of course that we provide a corresponding platform, a platform where the customer can retrieve integrated services quite easily, and from the new sale of a, or the sale of a new vehicle, maintenance, for example, and also the used vehicle offers to have one simplified platform that is unified. Now, many of our guests will say, "Well, look, I mean." The digital customer journey, that, that's something that, that normally started with the dealer. So, so what's the role that the dealerships are going to play in future if everything is now going to be digitalized? Well, no, the dealers remain and are an important asset for us. Why? Because online and offline are no contradiction. No, they are mutually interlinked. And if you get them seamlessly integrated, then you have a consistent experience. And of course, once more, it's the customer's choice at the end of the day. He decides what he wants, whether he wants to go digital online or does he want to take and pick and choose by going to the leadership, offline, on-site, by talking to the people he meets or he has known for many, many years at the dealer. And that, of course, also an interplay with the Audi brand. Now, Andy, I said it earlier, the Audi business innovation is really looking at special digital issues. And you are, shall we say, you're not just right in the midst of the transformation, you, you're actually a few years ahead, aren't you, of that transformation. What are the challenges you're facing? Well, look, Wolfgang, in your daily work, you can't, you can't go much further than 
one or two years because the speed of change is so high. That's what we noticed over the last years. Things that are planned over the long term never really materialize as such. You have to be able to react very swiftly, very quickly, and adjust accordingly in your working manner and also the issues you address. What we can say is, of course, that digitalization has become a USP. It has become a clear differentiator. It differentiates and sets us apart from competitors, what we can see from them, and what we can and want to offer. And I think making services available, focusing on providing a seamless customer journey will be a key factor for the future. And this is something we're working on. We're working flat out on this and with a lot of pressure, I must say. And uh, I'd say with lust and enjoyment and uh, yeah, enthusiasm. You're right, you're right, Andy. But nonetheless, I mean, with all of the daily work, um, we still keep remaining focused on the future and um, where we might will soon have an automated or autonomous drive experience. And there, we want to be able to have an ecosystem that will be very much focused on the experiences while you drive. Because, of course, the task of driving will be assumed more and more by the vehicle, affording you completely new possibilities. And so we think the vehicle will transform into what we would call an experience device. I can think completely a new what experiences will become possible in the car and in the end of the day the customers will then have a completely new drive experience and will use the car quite differently. Well thank you very much for that chat. Andreas and Boris, these were an overview of the possibilities digitalization affords us and of course if the car now becomes an experience device, if drive time becomes free time then of course, also the cabin becomes more and more important. I'm Christiane Zorn. I'm the head of product marketing at Audi. I'm Renate Fachenauer, responsible for the development of the interior and of interaction, as well as for displays, operating concepts, and data management. We at Audi are convinced Thanks to digitalization, mobility is becoming more personal, more intelligent and safer. And that is a key driver for the mobility experience of the future. The topic of a holistic digital ecosystem also plays a major role. In technical development, our focus is not only on integrating the digital worlds that our customers occupy in a safe and stable way. Ultimately, this is also a question of data privacy. But in particular, our focus is also on how we can simultaneously create a premium experience that never fails to delight our users, day in, day out. Today, we are achieving that through an intelligent operating concept on the one hand, and through very fast, simple connection of our smartphones on the other. In addition, we are integrating a variety of apps and services in our infotainment system, such as Amazon Music or even Alexa. In China, and for China, we have developed a very special device. It runs an Android-based operating system and provides an app store to enable even better integration of the customer's ecosystem. We are continuing to press ahead with this topic for the international markets too. But a very important advantage from my perspective is the enrichment of our customers' ecosystem because with our vehicles, we are able to offer services that are not possible in that form with consumer electronics. In the area of battery electric vehicles especially, that becomes particularly clear when it comes to charging or vehicle management. That's right. Online services play a very important role in the use of our e-tron vehicles in particular. Their importance and relevance is confirmed very clearly by customer feedback. But for me, digitalization amounts to more than just digital services. Above all, a customer-oriented, progressive interior with various displays and interactive features is very clearly part of a genuine Audi 2. What do you think, Renate? Absolutely, Christiane. I share your view entirely. We are providing a complete experience for all the senses that is both emotive and orchestrated. And we want to make it absolutely convincing by adding a new spatial dimension in the interior. Let's take our augmented reality head-up display, for example. It is a technology that combines the virtual and real worlds in a completely new way. Let me sum it up like this. Innovative and interconnected functions of the future require the 
architecture of the interior and of the display and operating concept to merge into one unit. Exactly. It is particularly important to factor in all occupants, not only the driver, because the passengers also occupy an important role in the experience-oriented interior of the future. We already demonstrated how entertaining and innovative such solutions can look with the Holoride Showcase at CES 2019. And of course, these trends have a major influence on technical development. Definitely, highly automated driving, for example, will bring about completely new user behavior for our customers. Because now we are at a point where drive time will really become free time. As a result, entirely new customer wishes will be possible, and we will adapt our interior of the future to those, as well as variable seat positions that need to create an ideal feeling of space in a variety of use cases. Many other areas are involved, such as spectacular sound or interior lighting effects. In order to achieve these goals, we must, of course, get to know our customers even better. And we have already launched numerous projects to that end. We are using artificial intelligence to record the wishes and statements of our customers in the most accurate way. But that really is a topic for a separate presentation. Yes, you're absolutely right there, Renate. But it's true. We survey our customers regularly. We listen closely and analyze trends and technologies, including those from other areas and industries. And I am truly convinced that we will also delight our customers in the future with a variety of additional functions and thus create a sense of loyalty to the brand. For the entire display and experience world in our Audi vehicles, we are planning lots of new innovations for the future together. So get ready to be surprised. With the digitalization, obviously, the entire business model is changing. Audi's business model, and maybe not just of the automotive industry, but of the entire industry. And that's what we will talk about next. How are we doing this at Audi? And that's together with Felix Schwabe. He is our head of digital business development at Audi. Now, it's an exciting topic there, Felix, that you are taking care of. How is Audi ready and preparing itself for this? Tell us a little about the potential potential you see. Well, Audi has been for years fully focused on digitalization and data-based services. That's our advantage, because this way we've been able to have plenty of ablers already in our cars, because you already have services on the road today. And that's an issue that I would say we can really observe today, whether that's, for example, swarm services, whether that's new insurance policies, telematic insurance policies, all of that can already be experienced live in our cars. Now, where do you get all that data from? And how do you manage to create new services and functions? Well, that's really the core job of the digital business development. Because on the one hand, we've got the customer. They change. We now speak about the user. We speak about the experience. And the time that the user spends in our cars is changing. We need to understand which services, which products does he want to have? What is he ready and willing to share his data with? And on the other hand, we've got the car, the technology, the data available, at what frequencies are they available. And these two worlds are merged together. That means the user, our customers, they shall have the best experiences and the best services that he may use privately or for business reasons. Now, very good and valuable information that, of course, you can draw from uh, these data. So, what's the customer benefit that maybe our viewers would be interested in? What's the benefit for the user and the customer if we use their data? Well, the potential of data is enormous. Allow me to give you an example here, an example in case. You're sitting in the car and you want to drive from Munich to Berlin. Now, imagine you are rolling out of Munich with green light all at the traffic lights because the information is received directly by the car. You're warned of any hazards on the road, slippery roads, snow, poor visibility. All of that optimized and will make your drive much more comfortable and safe. Then you will receive information about traffic, petrol stations, charging stations, or you get current traffic information uplayed into the car. And that mix of these services is already live and of course a lot more will come our way in future. 
Now, when we speak about this, of course, data protection is something we need to consider as well. That's a central topic here for us at Audi. Maybe we can just tell our customers how we deal and what we do with data protection. Very good point, very important point, Wolfgang. Data protection is very close to us and it's vitally important. The basis is the German Data Protection Act or data protection as such. With data, of course, you have to distinguish between two pots, so to say. You have the anonymized data and you've got the personalized data. We use or put great effort in having data anonymized in such a way that it's impossible to, well, deduce the individual car or customer. And that's what we call the swarm data. With personalized data, for us, it's extremely important that the customer any time at all times has such a sovereign decision which data I'm willing to share, which services do I want to use, and which data I do I not want to share. But even that is not enough for us yet, no. And that's why we have developed what we call a privacy mode. Now, imagine, it's like, like, like on your cell phone, with a with flight mode. If you activate the flight mode, no data will leave your car, except those that are statutorily required, like, for example, the automatic hazard or breakdown call. Interesting. Now, have you got specific norms, standards, regulations that um, give us a, a very clear framework here? Indeed. Especially the European Union is really in the lead here worldwide, and I think that's extremely important. That's the only way that we can provide a high standard of data protection and a safe data economy. We, as Audi, are very active in this. We are proactive here. We already are on board in an early phase. We monitor, we observe the norms, standards, and regulations on our co-shapers. For example, have a look at extended vehicle, as we call it. It's a standardized ISO standard with which we define which data can be transferred free of discrimination, fair and safely with third parties and in which way that transfer happens. Are you actually actively cooperating in the thrashing out of these standards? Yes, of course, of course. Like, for example, the current issues of um, data protection. That's something that for us as an OEM is vitally important. And here we're really at the front of the development. We are in the lead almost. We co-shape these ISO standards. We're also active in their future direction. And I can promise you, in the next few years, plenty of these rules and regulations will come to the market worldwide. And here we are ready, or we're right in the midst in their development, which, of course, offers our customers an extreme high standard of data protection. So we are right in the midst of a very exciting topic of, as we well also see, new business models afforded to us by digitization. I mean, I know there's people out there that don't like it and some that are partners. You're right, you're right. I mean, the whole digitalization is called predestined for forming new partnerships and corporations. Let me to give you two examples. Principally important is the fact that the user experiences an added value. And so, with our partner here, we brought their technology and their map material and merged that with our information. The result of that is high-resolution maps with current information on traffic jams, on traffic situations, on hazard situations, or, well, traffic flow. Another example that I'd like to bring is from the category of Holoride and Entertainment. It's, an ent it's a startup that we founded in 2018 and which affords a completely new experience in the entertainment area. In this, we combine vehicle data with entertainment data. That means you have a super elastic content so that you can watch on your VR goggles and with that, you've got the feeling, well, you're completely out there in space and time. I mean, for people that would normally have motion sickness, hey, for them, we can reduce that motion sickness almost to zero with that and that's all possible thanks to vehicle data. And this is something that I must say, you, Audi viewers, you have to try it yourself. This is this is great. In Salzburg at the famous opera festival, the, 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 there were some festival participants that were chauffeured in our Audi vehicles in the back and had a historic city tour offered to them, which is slightly different. It was slightly different, but of course that was possible with all that meta reality. So, Felix, thank you very much. That was very exciting talking to you. We will have you back on the Q&A round. Um, I just want to recall and remind you: send your questions ready now because. With the chat function on the micro side, you can send in your questions as we talk, and then we'll get started very quickly soon later in the Q&A session, because we don't just want to um, present these things to you, but we want to talk 
and chat with you online, and we look forward to it. And therefore, maybe or just an opinion from you, and of course, also your questions that we will then seek to answer. Okay, so far we've only spoken about the possibilities of digitalization, but now let's have a look at the technical requirements and preconditions. And we're back here, as you can see, in a new constellation. And now I have plenty of experts here already with me, experts that are all immersed in the connectivity of the car, the 5G technology and the likes. And that, of course, is vitally important to understand what we have in plan and in store, what are the technical requirements for our cars. Now, let me start by introducing the gentleman here. Christoph Vogt here. He's our head of development connectivity, mobile communications, car to X and the likes. So anything to do with the connectivity with the wider infrastructure. Next to me, I've got Andres Toys. He's project manager, and he coordinates anything to do with safety and security. And he works for Cariat, so our special agency for software development. We'll come back to that later. And we've got Jörg Plechinger. He's our expert to do with connectivity, head of mobile connectivity platform. And well, anything to do with 5G technology. And maybe, Christopher, I can start with you. Because we as Audi, as an OEM, we will, by default, be the first one to offer 5G as default onto the road. Now, what's so special about this new mobile communication standard 5G? Well, 5G will be a huge leap when it comes to data rate compared with LTE. We assume that about 20 gigabit per second are possible and downline about 10 gigabytes in the uplink. That's the potential. And that's quite a bit, I can tell you. But we will also see a much better latency of just a few milliseconds, as well as a guaranteed quality of service. And these two features are for us as a car manufacturer so important, because with a swift and fast communication that's reliable, we can make driving a car more safe. Now, why is 5G such a game changer? Why is this topic, this issue, so hot? Jörg, to you. That's your, that's your, that's your hot potato, isn't it? Well, I'd say 5G is a game changer because, of course, in combination with CV2X, it means that for the first time we can now have autonomous and, I would say, above all, cooperative vehicles, cars that can communicate, can talk with one another. And what that really means, well, that's something that Jörg can tell you to explain to you. Yes, CV2X means cellular vehicle to everything, the communication of the car with its environs using the mobile communication technology. And with the new 5G communication, our car can now talk, communicate, with other cars. But of course, the technology can also be used for communication with traffic lights and anything else like a parking garage or complex route guidance systems. Mm. But Audi has been researching for years in the connectivity of vehicles. So can you give us a few examples? Indeed. Let's have a look at the United States. We have a famous case that we tested there, and that is the four-way stop. Anybody who has been to the States knows this. You come to an intersection, normally the one who arrives first has the right of way. If it's unclear, then the traffic participants have to communicate and coordinate by, well, hand-waving or whatever. And with CVTX in the United States, we've been able to resolve this by developing an algorithm that will show the driver which sequence they can all go over the intersection so everybody can pass the intersection sound and safely. Wow, you realize already this topic of connectivity is something that is very much to do with safety and security. We've got another example, ladies and gentlemen, namely when it comes to pedestrian protection. Right, that's something we did in Europe. Here we collaborated with partners in Turin in 2019, where we had 5G communication 
deployed. For example, if a pedestrian is inattentive on the road, then with 5G, the driver in the road, on in the car, and the pedestrian can be warned, and thus their safety can be increased. Another example was something we did together with Ducati in our customer experience center in Neuburg. Here, we war did what is, of course, if you go and turn into a road without no right of way, if you head into that as a cyclist, of course, you need to be warned or anybody coming on the road with the right of way so that there's no danger upcoming when you turn into such a major road. Now, we can, of course, imagine, dear viewers, you listening, that there's quite a few bits and bytes flying around here and, of course, going through the, well, cable harness in the car. And now that brings Carrot on board, our software development hub. I mean, everybody's been talking about it, and the IAA, the International Automotive say, uh, Fair, you will have and see them with their own booth, and you have to visit them to see what we are really developing, shall we say, out of the heart of Audi, developing for the entire heart. So, Andres, tell us, what are you working on right now? Well, the huge potential of 5G to the CVTX is, of course, something that will well, develop technologies and concrete projects. For example, right now in the United States, we're looking at risk situations for a particularly endangered group, that's the school children on their way. So those cars that will come into what we call a snail pace area will automate it, receive a warning prompt from CV2X. And those cars that need to be warned, for example, if there's a school bus nearby where children come in or out, will also be warned. And it's these kind of projects that later on then will give rise to the new functions for zero production. And that, of course, brings us right into the media days, right on, bang on, because these are, shall we say, inspiration for your stories, dear viewers, and we've got lots more of them, because we spoke about China earlier, which is, of course, our biggest sales market. Now, we know the Chinese are very, well, they're almost, I would say, technology um, and lovers. What do you plan for the Chinese market? Well, in China, we will have the first functions on the basis of cv 2 x technology coming to serial production in combination with 5G. That's for the start of the A6 and A7 long wheelbase version, and then in the further sequence for further models that are coming to the Chinese market. Now, these cars will send and receive warnings if there's a breakdown in another car, if there's an accident, or if there's poor visibility. And they receive that not via the cloud, but they communicate directly, directly with all other Audi cars that are ready for reception in their environs. And what's more, these cars will receive a spontaneous warning if the car up front is braking strongly. And with that, there's the potential of a, well, hitting that car, especially if you can't see that car that's taking such a sharp break up front. Wow. Now, this car to X communication is a very complex working field, which I know and I'm sure our viewers know as well. So, I mean, you have to imagine a car need not only communicate with all the other cars, it has to communicate with the ambient environments, with the infrastructure. How do you manage all this? Well, for us personally, a major challenge was, of course, to define what we call communication standards and rules and regulations with other OEMs. Because, of course, at the end of the day, our joint objective is to improve traffic safety. And it's only possible if most can, everybody can benefit from it. And that means, of course, we need the support. And we get that in China, especially from the authorities. And, I mean, as you can imagine, this way only could we develop these kind of use cases, for example, a warning for any emergency police cars coming away. That could be quickly brought to serial production. Once more, what about China? Is China really an innovation driver here? Oh, absolutely. It's not just the authorities and regulations. No, it's the Chinese customers as well. They just expect to have the latest digital functions on board the car. And so far, it was only obvious to start with a 5G network in China. And, of course, accordingly, I mean, the Chinese market is developing at the moment more and more, especially when you look at digitalization, to becoming a trailblazer. Now, Christoph, we heard earlier already from Boris Miners and Andreas Sicheneder that the car is becoming an experience device. So the drive time is becoming free time. Now, to what extent are the 5G technologies connectivity playing a role for you in the development. Well, 5G, of course, is vitally important for us because it helps us to make the customer experience even more intense in the car. Vice versa, of course, we can also increase and improve safety. But that's not everything. No, what really keeps us on the move is autonomous vehicles. Because with 5G, we now 
for the first time, have the possibility that the cars are cooperating with one another. Cooperating with one another means they are now able to really, well, look at critical situations and solve them in a combination of their well, intercommunication. And to this become possible, we've got the 5G Automotive Association that we co-established, whose chairman, by the way, I am. That has brought us to a point that now for the first time we are in a position where we can have the 5G standard defined collectively and can develop it collectively. And since then, of course, as an automotive producer, 5G is so important. It is not just a pure telecommunication standard, but it is actually an automotive standard or co-automotive standard. So if you have any questions on 5G on connectivity, the Q&A session will be the point to really address them and to delve deeper into these issues. And you can do so by just using the microsite where you can send in your questions over the chat function. But first of all, thanks to you. Christoph, Andres, and Jörg. Now, we'll take a leap into the production. Here, the factory right behind us, where the cars are actually really rolling off the assembly line. And here, we're looking at the digitalization of production and logistics. Everything using the space frame. Quattro drives, high-performance engines. Car production has always been a cradle of high-tech. And our smart production is becoming increasingly clever. In many digital technologies, Audi is already a leader in the industry. The coronavirus pandemic has accelerated the digitalization of production further still. At the same time, it's the high degree of digitalization in particular that got us through the pandemic in good shape. Thanks to virtual assembly planning and 3D scanning, we were able to master the ramp-up of the Audi e-tron GT in record time. And thanks to training courses with virtual reality, the production team also took decisive steps forward. Digitalization is never an end in itself. We drive it forward in a targeted way, where it will bring us and our customers a tangible benefit. At the same time, Audi benefits the global production network and interconnectedness within the Volkswagen Group. Individual sites develop pilot projects through to series maturity. Then we roll this technology out worldwide. The Neckar Zulm site is playing a key role in this at the moment. In the network of the Automotive Initiative 2025, it's a pilot plant and therefore a living laboratory for the digital transformation. We're already making pioneering contributions to digitalization, to vehicle tracking using RFID technology, and to smart maintenance today. This is where the leading plant for digital production and logistics within the group is being created. But pioneering digital solutions are coming from all sites. However, one thing is clear to us. The smartest thing about a smart production facility is its people. That's why we're enhancing and developing their skills strategically. In line with personal capability, we want to make sure every employee is fully prepared for our digital advances. A lot of reinforcement for our IT team comes from our team on the production lines, for example. That makes me particularly proud because in the digital transformation in particular, all of our actions must be aimed at ensuring that production offers a future. An even more flexible production, an even more digitalized production, more efficient, more digitalized. That's what Peter Kessler in that brief clip announced and, well, told us about. And that's what it's about right next. Which technology do we need for this? And for that, we have the next round of experts here with us in the studio. And we have Britta Neubus next to me, who is looking at digitalization and Audi as the head of data-driven production. Then we've got Michael Korte here 
next to me. He's responsible for the development of the technologies at the back of it. And we've got, we've got Christoph Hagmüller here. He's head of IT services. So thanks for having the three of you here with me. It's exciting. And Britta, I'm asking my first, my, my, I'm asking you, what do you need to drive digitalization in the plants? Well, first and foremost, data, because digitalization without a solid database is impossible. Every day, we're creating masses of data at all of our sites. So at the moment, we're working very hard on connecting them globally so that we can use these data even better. And what really helps is that we're part of the Volkswagen Group. The Volkswagen Industrial Cl Cloud gathers all of data of machines, plants, and systems of all of our factories and sites. That is a central topic in our software development centers, the SDCs, once being built in Neckarsulm at the moment. And on the basis of our digital production platforms, the DPPs, we are developing high-performance IT solutions for a connected and smart factory. And now, that is a message that we like to convey also to the outside world. We are strong because we are part and parcel of a strong group of companies. And we are playing a strong role in that, aren't we, Britta? Absolutely. Audi has a central role when it comes to digitalization of the Volkswagen Group. As part of the Automotive Initiative 2025, we will take the site in Neckarsulm and turn it into a leading plant and site for digital production and logistics as part of the group. We have partners on our side, for example, the Fraunhofer Institute for Industrial Engineering, the Technical University Munich is also a very important partner, SAP, Capgemini, you name them. Now, for all of you who don't know where Neckarsulm actually is, well, Neckarsulm is our second big production site in Germany. I mean, we here in Ingolstadt, that's Bavaria in the south near Munich. Ingo, uh, Neckarsulm is a bit over to the southwest, so closer to Stuttgart, and that's where Christoph was working. Now, Christoph, you are working for Audi IT services there, and if you hear what um, Britta has just said to us, I mean, that's a challenge for you, isn't it? Indeed, indeed. But it's an exciting challenge. And with the AI25, the Automotive Initiative 2025, we want to have a worldwide center of competence for the transformation of factories and sustainable innovation. And especially the Neckarsulm site, given its regional environment, has ideal preconditions for that. Now, and another important precondition to drive forward the digitalization, of course, is, I'd say, the openness of our workforce. We need their commitment, we need their know-how, we need their expertise, and above all, their willingness, their courage to try out something new and to really go along that digital change. Then what's, what's the targets that you pursuing with the AI25? And, and what do you expect from the collaboration with the other partners? Well, look, the AI25 has a really holistic approach. We're not just looking at the technological aspect, which of course is vitally important in technology change, but we're also taking good view of the person, human people and the organization. So if there's a, a colleague from the workforce, we, we offer them clear future perspectives. As Britta said, next to further training and further development of IT structures and systems, we of course also need digital competencies and expertise on all levels of our organization. And here, the initiative wants to, well, give the right stimulus. At the same time, with our next own plant, we have the possibility to find solutions and, well, have a pilot project to bring them early into zero production and then roll them out for the entire group. And then as part of Industrial Cloud Initiative, also make them ready for the external market. Wow. If you've got questions on the automotive initiative, just send them in to us. Use the chat function on the microsite. Another question to you, Christoph. What concrete projects and use cases in the production are you working on right now? Well, I mean, the deployment of RFID, for example, for vehicle identification and localization. But we've got other smart solutions like driverless transport systems, or we use predictive maintenance solutions to well, have a look at our equipment. How can that be run more efficiently? And we use already AI algorithm, for example, in quality assurance. Just, I mean, that we have the right parts um, detected 
in an automated way. Okay, Michael, over to you now. Let's take another look at the technology and engineering side of this. What do you need in the plants to improve your digital work and to work maybe even more efficiently, and as we just heard, to use 5G for well, communication? Indeed, we also see 5G as offering us quite new possibilities. Simply the performance, I mean, the data rate is 100 times higher than current mobile communication stands or the low latency times, which is so important for managing equipment or the use cases that Christoph mentioned. This all benefits us and afford, well, affords us new possibilities for implementing that in the plants. Now, we spoke about smart production at Audi, and in order to achieve these targets, 5G is an important building block. We are developing this technology in the Audi production lab, and we're pretty close to zero production where we use the technology on the use cases, and that offers us the means to also then bring it quickly into the wider zero production. So we are really a firm believer in that 5G technology, and I think we are well on our way, actually. Uh, some of you say, look, I've also got 5G on my smartphone. Um, well, if I pass next Zoom, the plant, let's see what I can hear and find out about their 5G network. Is that possible or are you, are you sort of uh, hermetically sealed off? No, we put great value on having our own campus network, as we call it. We will have our own campus fat site network. I mean, the technologies and the frequencies are, of course, reserved for industry, which affords us then the means and the possibility that the operating and the uh, management and maintenance of that network is in our own hands. And of course, when you look at warranty, if you look at the protection of um, confidential business information and patterns, all of this can be realized with our own campus network. And of course, the capacities in that network need to be prioritized according to our needs so that by use case, we can distribute capacities. At the end of the day, this performant infrastructure of that network shall be used to make an agile and flexible production possible as part of the Audi Smart Production. Now, if you hear all this driverless transportation systems, robots and the likes, I mean, do we still need our Audi experts and where do we need them in the plant? Oh, definitely. I think we need even more of these experts, especially if you look at um, technologies like digitalization, IT or electromobility. We need more experts. And for us, it's vitally important that that's also Forsprung durch Technik, that People and machines need to be connected intelligently and need to work hand in glove, and that also our workforce. I mean, shall I say, well, we shall move on from boring, dull um, activities and do, shall we say, higher value work, value creation work. To make this possible, we at Audi have our own academy, the Audi Academy. And already this year, we've planned about 2,000 experts to be trained through that Audi Academy and to be trained specifically in these fields of competence of IT, digitalization, or electromobility. Wow, that was a brief overview into the production and the digitalization in production. But of course, there's no need to call it a day here because we can talk about it later in the Q&A session. So thanks for this round. I mean, we all should say that our guests should really visit our plans and go on a guided tour through Ingolstadt or Neckarsulm or any other of our international sites because it's so exciting to see how modern car production looks like today. I mean, I can only invite you. It's super exciting. I can only encourage you to do so. But this brings us to the end of the presentation show. But now it's time for you, for your questions, your comments. Send them in using the microsite and the chat function. And in a few seconds, we'll continue with the Q&A. Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is the week of the Audi Media Days. Maybe you already joined us in one of the previous days where we talked at length about corporate and business, about digitalization and how Audi and the entire industry is changing. Today now, it's about another extremely important topic, by the way, also for you, for everybody, really, in fact, and especially for us at Audi 
in our strategy. Today is all about sustainability and environmental protection. So, in the upcoming 30 minutes, we want to show you that we are future ready, that we at Audi have plenty of progress on offer. It's just a few days until the International Automotive Trade Show in Munich will kick off, and maybe you will join us here. And if you do so, be our guest. If not, these media days are ideal to put you up on the state what's happening at Audi. And I'm calling here from a tiny, nifty little studio in Ingolstadt in Germany, right bang on in the center of the plant in Ingolstadt, here between where the cars are being built and the livery, where you can pick up a car and where many countless proud Audi customers pick up their new cars. So this is the best place to talk about sustainability. Now, we'll kick it off with a look at our offer. What have we got up our sleeve when it comes to electric mobility above all? Well, we're quite proud of well, our e-tron models, and they all come from our R&D, from our technical development department, which means thousands of people working on this, and I've got the boss here with me, Oliver Hoffman, board member for technical development. Now, you are, as I said, the board member for technical development, and you have a huge program to cover, because now, let's listen to the first figures. As of 2026, we at Audi want to produce purely electric models and bring them to market. And by 2033, we will have the combustion engine production phased out. Now, that's a huge change for you in the technical development. So, Oliver, can you give us just an overview why this decision? Well, I think with that decision, we may have caught the one or the other by surprise, but of course, we've got the biggest transformation in the automotive industry ahead of us. And this will only work if you are very focused by addressing these very issues which we're doing. And so we made a clear commitment in this strategy. It's not just a matter of economic interests, but also social interests here. And of course, your developers must completely rethink. Well, look, the decision we're taking today doesn't only affect us, doesn't only affect the here and now, but it affects coming generations. And that's why we are quite clear and fully committed towards electric mobility. You just said it. It's not just a social claim, it's a claim to us, to us as a company, and we need to manage this transformation with all the colleagues at Audi. And we have a lot of highly competent developers, engineers, who we have to take along. Now, the discussion is fully ongoing out there, also in the media. We know that you daily address these issues. Will Audi have only battery electric vehicles in the future or also hydrogen-powered cars or e-fuel-powered cars? Well, we looked at the whole gambit and we found that in the transformation towards green-generated electric power and to have that transfer to other media, you always have efficiency losses from the transformation. The most efficient way is the direct storage of electric power in batteries, and that's what we're doing with battery electric vehicles. The availability of green power is, of course, something that's still limited. That's something we have to work on. 
one and well green hydrogen is not something that's available in sufficient quantity yet and of course it will also be used for the decarbonization of industry and so the battery electric mobility is the right way ahead which means with our electric vehicles that we have right now the e-trons that's what we're offering as we speak but of course all of that, most emissions come during the usage phase of a car so how do we manage that also our current e-tron models can become even greener well you just mentioned it the usage phase is crucial green innovation is always a bit of a well cumbersome term i'd like to explain it it's about expanding renewable energy sources on an industrial scale so we really think big here and to this end we have engaged and in cooperation with utility providers with energy utility suppliers for example in europe that by 2025 we will have a host of new solar and wind plants in germany that will produce green power in terawatt quantities which is about 250 new wind turbines at these five terawatt hours of additional green power and of course further project will follow but why because the consumption of an entire each one fleet shall be covered by renewable energy well it's not just a matter of cooperation though isn't it we want to say quite clearly that we've also developed our own solution also on a group level can you tell us a few more about these well of course customers want a simple and an area-wide availability of relatively generated power for their Audi and that is to our mind a crucial factor in the acceptance of electric mobility and already as we speak Audi customers for example can charge at home by using our Volkswagen and also Ellie for green power electricity for charging on the way and about we have got the partner Ionity and many other operating companies with charging booths offering green electric power and especially the fast charging booths are important for short charging times that will allow you to well they will facilitate these and of course with the Audi charging hub we now have developed a solution that shall cover a bubble peak demand which means well yeah whenever there's peak times customers want to charge their cars cars um, this is a part of project that I'm quite proud of we're actually rolling out in Nuremberg but I believe there's experts here our project team they should report themselves about what they're doing you're quite right the Audi charging hub is something that's worth our while to maybe look closer into or well write a story about it but here the following clip you'll hear more about it You can assume there will be more and more batteries as we are adding more battery electric vehicles to the fleet. Experience shows us that we can take batteries from almost 92% of all test vehicles and give them into a secondary use before they are then recycled sustainably. We realize quickly that these batteries can be used to develop very innovative products, such as various types of battery storage systems. We've got three main components installed here. One is our charging station, then the battery storage, which at 525 kilowatt hours has as much storage capacity as five and a half e-tron vehicles. And thirdly, is the connection to the public grid. So you can really say our power cube works like the logic of a rain barrel. A little energy trickles in at the top and we draw this energy out at the bottom with a lot of power. In other words, we take electricity from the public grid and fast feed a lot of power into our vehicles. As soon as we have a flat sealed surface, we can park the cube. The whole thing also works as a standalone solution. That means it can be parked and you can fast charge in a few minutes. Depending on the use case, I can have add-on functions supplementing the cube. This can be an additional battery storage, but also a lounge, as we will present it at the Audi charging hub in Nuremberg. The principal idea of the Audi charging hub is to address the issue of peak demand via a reservation function that gives the customer the opportunity to reserve a charging slot in advance. That is really our own idea, and we call it give the customer quality time back. Now, of course, the Audi charging hub is a public charging network, meaning anyone can charge. 
While the customer is charging, we also want to offer him a premium experience, which we do with the lounge area on the upper floor. For us, a module construction was pretty obvious. And here in Vilshofen, we're here with our colleagues from Metron, and we found the right partner for the project and its realization. The charging hub has a gross floor area of about 400 square meters, and the upper floor alone has 250 square meters of usable space. Now, I'm not aware of any comparable concept. In the end, this hub solves many of the problems we see today at existing charging stations. Uncomfortable charging, without a roof, in the last corner for service area. We want to solve this by offering a fast charging park with a lounge area for our customers. So you can see that we are firmly resolved when it comes to electric mobility, but of course we don't have to want to talk with ourselves only, but also we want to engage with you, dear viewers. These media days serve the purpose of exchanging opinion, questions, views with you. And use that microsite, please, because there you already can send in your questions over the chat function. And later on in the Q&A session, we will then hook you up with the experts and answer your questions. Now, Oliver, as we just heard, second life use of batteries was already mentioned, and that's an important topic, isn't it? I mean, I'm asked almost daily, so what are you going to do with the batteries once they have run their course? What's the significance for you in the development? Well, I think this is a cool and smart solution that we're offering here. We're giving the batteries a second life cycle, meaning if they're returned from test vehicles, because they're no longer usable in the test vehicle, then we can use them in that charging hub where they still can serve a good purpose. They store energy and, as we see, they just get a second life cycle, which I think is a super smart solution. It's almost like a buffer storage. Indeed. Well, that means the batteries will already find usage far beyond their time in the car. Indeed, indeed. Of course, the requirements in the car are quite different. While in the charging hub, they have a different operating strategy how these batteries can be deployed, and that means they can be used simply much, much longer. So, okay, we'll just hold on to this for a minute. We use the batteries also after the time of the car as energy storage, but at one time there must be a, a final end. No, what do you do then? How do you recycle them? Well, as you said, there's an end, of course. I mean, the second, that the smart solution of that second life to extend the life cycle must come to some final end. That's right. But then we've We've got means of recycling the batteries, which we can also do with a high efficiency ratio. And recycling is done together with a partner project in Salzgitter, that is Volkswagen Group site, where the batteries are then fed into the recycling and we can regain well, the raw commodities in the batteries contained. Well, thanks, Oliver. Good information here that we received from you. And of course, we will see you later in the Q&A session again when the media have the chance to also experience your life once more. But now we showed you how our cars can be used ever greener. But of course, mobility is not just a matter of being out and about with your car, because do you actually know what your personal CO2 footprint is all about and how it's generated? Now, to this end, we'll just present you with an app with which you can actually check and monitor your CO2 footprint. For me, design is identifying a problem, finding a solution, and then developing a user-based product. What does it mean if I fly to New York? What does it mean if I drive my car? How much CO2 emissions am I generating? EcoMove allows the customer to measure their entire CO2 mobility footprint. And with that knowledge, he can reduce his CO2 emissions. I was one of the very first to come to Berlin to build up the Audi Denkwerkstatt. That's now four years ago. We've become an established player here in Berlin in this innovation ecosystem. We're developing digital business models for the mobility of the future. Now, for me, it was particularly exciting to work on a product which goes well beyond the car and to work on a solution in the entire context of mobility. I'm here in Berlin because I want to create something new. And that's the very point where we're right now with EcoMove.
Well, I'm highly excited to hear from you. How are we going to handle these tools in future? I mean, is it going to be like a fitness tracker? I mean, well, let's just wait and see how your CO2 footprint develops in your daily life. So as we heard, it's developing our startup in Berlin in what we call the Audi Think Tank. I've got two guys there with me from the Think Tank. It's Jakob Neep and Tim Mischke. Now, tell us a little more, Tim. Well, look, the Think Tank is something quite special. We would call it a jewel within the innovation network of Audi. We are like a speedboat at the interface between the startup and the big corporation. And it's our job to develop new digital products and services in the context of mobility, to which we've got a highly motivated team. We're situated in a co-working space here in Willing in that, well, Berlin ecosystem. But why Berlin? Well, there's two reasons that speak for Berlin. First of all, Berlin is an international metropolitan area with plenty of mobility requirements. And, well, we're confronted with, it, with these, and the customers there are pretty diverse. And diverse customers are, of course, important for the input for our, well, ideation. But it's at the same time like the crucible of the startup scene in Germany. We've got investors, we've got founders, startups, but also artists and creative guys. And because we work so closely with them, in finding solutions, well, well, we find particularly creative ideas, and that's why we find it's an ideal site. Now, ideas are one thing, but the implementation, of course, is the second important spec. How do, how do you manage, how do you create innovation? Well, look, the starting point for everything we do is the customer. We ask them, what's your needs, what's your requirements to your mobility today or tomorrow? And uh, what's pressing you, what do you like to change? And then we start to develop solution, solutions and, and prototypes. And these prototypes will then be tested together with the customers in ever shorter iterations and cycles. And say, and ask him, is this how we imagine it to be? And if the customer says, ah, now this could be an interesting one, then we actually will cast it, shall we say, in a project, on a pilot project. And then we'll, we'll start another startup to bring it to market like we did with EcoMove. Now, Jakob, you were instrumental in the EcoMove lab. Is this something that customers wanted? The answer is clearly yes. Customers want to know how they can make a contribution to such a complex issue like climate change. And they also want to know what possibilities they have to bring down their own CO2 footprint. And as Tim already said, with that, we thought very much customer-centric and have really found a bespoke solution. That's EcoMove. Ah, so it's a kind of a tool. It's a tool that you can use. How do, how do you get access to it? Well, look, it's a tool you can download from the App Store as of October. Everybody can download it, not only Audi customers. It's available for everybody. Now, it's vitally important for us to understand that EcoMove rests on three pillars. On transparency, reducing and compensating. Meaning, with this transparency, it's all a matter of showing, showing what are the consequences of your choice of means of transport. In the reduction, it's a matter of using that information to then take an informed decision. And, but by the way, all of this happens fully automated. No need to enter any data. Now, I can imagine that our views may be saying right now, okay, all nice and fine, but how, I mean, how do I know and decide, how do you get the people to actually change at the end of the day in their behavior? Good one. Yes, I mean, the, how shall I say, the people want to have a transparency, this three-pillar transparency, as I said, understanding, reducing and balancing, compensating, and we have a very playful approach. We award sustainable mobility with virtual badges and awards. I mean, we sort of stir the, the, the hunter and gatherer instinct in all of us, and it's, it's, well, it's a sustainable approach. Okay, I've understood. It's quite playful, and it's well, so deadly serious. You can try it out, you can play around with it, and just check. What are you doing? How is your own footprint? No matter which means of transport you're using. And of course, that can be fun, can be, well, entertaining if you use it, especially in the Audi. So the EcoMove app was developed by you, Tim. Have you got new projects also in the pipeline? Well, as you know, we are constantly looking for new digital solutions. And in July, we send out two new teams with a new brief. And by the end of September, they will present in Berlin 
front of an expert jury, which has Audi and external experts sitting on the panel, and then we will decide together which of these ideas are so strong that we will try to bring them into serial production. I myself, I'm very much looking forward to this, because that's a very exciting moment to see how creative how things develop. But with EcoMove, you're also moving on, Jakob? Indeed. We are now really in the final tests to get the app ready in October via the regular App Store, where you can download it. Wow. We look forward to this, to great ideas and impulses. And if you have questions, dear viewers, on the EcoMove app to our startup, the Think Tank in Berlin, send them in. Let us know. We want to hear from you because the media days are all about you retaining information and exchanging with us. This is like, well, a kind of a research for you. And therefore, use the microsite where you can use the chat function to send in your questions that we will then answer in the Q&A session later on. Now, we heard this is all about sustainability and environmental protection. And here, it's not just a matter of looking at the cars and driving us such. No, it's also looking at how we produce our goods and products. And that, of course, also entails the supply chain. So we must be able to rely that the material we work with is green. And this is what we will look at next in the following clip to see what is a chain. A chain is an assembly of more than two connected pieces. Each of these pieces is called a link, and each of these links is essential for the chain to serve its purpose. This is a movie about our most important chain, the Audi supply chain. Chains can be so simple, ours isn't. An Audi is a digital platform that consists of millions of different parts, made out of hundreds of kilograms of different raw materials spread across the periodic table and the world. And every one of those raw materials has different supply chains itself, with up to nine stages before they come into direct contact with us. To get this more tangible, we at Audi contract more than 14,000 suppliers around the globe. That variety brings an enormous level of potential to develop the best products and services possible. And it comes with huge responsibilities to manage and enable this entire chain. In an era of climate change and globalization, we're making it a top priority to save resources and reduce our supply chain emissions. For example, in the downstream production process alone, we've saved more than 335,000 metric tons of CO2 on balance in 2020. How? We launched our Audi CO2 program in the supply chain. With this program, we strive to improve the carbon balance in the supply chain even before our vehicles complete their first kilometer on the road. Because we know that the use of green energy is a key factor in mitigating climate change risks, our program includes the use of green electricity in battery cell production. And we are starting to rethink linear supply chains by closing material loops. Where appropriate, we promote the use of secondary materials. An example is the aluminum closed loop established in 2017. High-grade aluminum scrap is fed back into our material supply chain. This process alone saved more than 165,000 metric tons of CO2 emissions in 2020, with a rising trend. We are making our contribution to closing in on our overall goal to become completely CO2 neutral on balance. Respecting human rights is a key priority for Audi. We are involved in various initiatives to drive new standards and to create tools that place the spotlight on the well-being of the people working in our supply chain. Human rights and social standards are set throughout our supply chain, even down to the extraction of raw materials that need to be obtained under humane and sustainable conditions. Progress through technology is our DNA. This is why we use new technologies to further increase transparency and traceability in our supply chains. New technologies like AI will help us to react faster and even more responsibly towards sudden incidents or changes. Through innovative approaches like the Audi Act for Impact program, we foster a positive impact by working hand in hand with our suppliers. After all, a chain is no stronger than its weakest link. That's why we care for each of the 14,000 links in our supply chain. Because linked properly, this chain can drive change.
Well, that was important to us to show this quite clearly. It is to do about social issues, compliance and environmental issues with the companies that we work with as suppliers. But how do we now manage that all the companies really pull their weight when it comes to sustainability? But this is something I'm going to ask Marco Ferrelepi, my colleague from the procurement strategy. Tell us, how do we do this? Well, it's important that we only collaborate with companies that share our values and we fix them in writing in what we call a code of conduct, so a code of collaboration. And this is something that we review since 2019. We've got what we call an S rating, a sustainability rating. And with that S rating, we just check that they stick to it. How do you do that in concrete detail? Well, as part of the S rating, if a supplier wants to receive the certificate, he has to go through a multi-stage process. It always starts by receiving his kind of well, identification where he doesn't have to just tick boxes, but they have to prove and provide certification, and experts will actually verify this. And if we are suspicious or can see there's a bit of a, hmm, a dodgy element there, then we will visit them on site. External service providers will check the supplier and will go on site to really review what they've said. And at the end of the day, we have a positive or a negative decision. And without a positive S rating, no business with the Audi group. And of course, you also have Vorsprung durch Technik with us, with the procurement, because since the end of 2020, we started something quite new. We're using AI, artificial intelligence, that supports us to really assess the manifold news and messages worldwide. We're looking at social media, for example. We are looking at public websites, at media outlets. And if we find any cause of suspicion, we can follow it up. So, if you, dear viewers of the international MIAs out there, if you write something about another company, a company that may have social or ecological mistakes or something that, that that's already, we, you find this out? Indeed. Artificial intelligence helps us to research broad and wide and even quicker. Compared with the traditional approach, we are now, what is it, about two months ahead. We know two months earlier if there's something going away. And of course, AI helps us also cluster elements. It looks quite pinpointed at issues, for example, violations against labor rights, labor laws, um, discrimination at the workplace, or pollution, or any other issues like well, data theft. That's become more and more important. It's been checked. Now, you just mentioned the social sphere. How deep do you drill this? How far do you really check up on the supply chain? Well, the social aspect is, of course, important because, I mean, we've got almost the entire periodic table in raw commodities that we use with. Because every commodity, every raw commodity, not just in the extraction, has an ecologic but also a social footprint. And, of course, here we need to understand what's happening at the source of mining and extraction. And that's a huge challenge. Because if you just look at the direct contact details that we have with the first tier suppliers, that's insufficient. But these issues usually happen at the very source of extraction. And here we need to have transparency. Transparency, which we want to achieve together with our partners, but also within the entire industry. So how do we generate that transparency to see what happens at the end of the whole supply chain? Meaning you, you sometimes even talk to, to, the, to the people living around uh, a mine? Indeed, we do. Yes, we do. We want to know what's happening on site. Is a local population in any way impaired? Is that uh, in conformity with our code of conduct? Okay, okay. But let's go back to what we have as a main issue today, and that's environmental protection here. And here, decarbonization, of course, plays a vital role. And most importantly, what's your approach? Well, first of all, we want to understand, to take a look at the entire life cycle of a car. And here, 20 to 50 percent of the CO2 emissions are generated by the supply chain of the car. And so in 2018, we set up our own CO2 programs with our suppliers to really raise awareness and to bring down emissions. And the biggest lever is, of course, energy. And that's why we require that green electric power is used in the production of our battery cells, for example. But there's other approaches as well, like, for example, the use of recycled materials, closing production loops, closing material loops, which we do very successfully with aluminum, but also, I mean, other innovations. That's the e-tron GT wire tire that's produced by CO2 certified aluminum. Well, thanks, Marco. You can see this is a very serious topic that we have taken this obligation and turned this into an art. This is something you will see in the following video, where you can see how much passion, how much enthusiasm and love goes into the 
aspect how our employees especially work. And here, for example, when you take a look at design. We really have to change our mindset towards sustainability. More than sustainable, I like to say ethical. So sourcing in a different way, talk about uh, where it's coming from, describe it, be transparent to the client. No? So material is not just the material, but where it's coming from, who collect it, who work on that, uh, the transformation on when we are on the industrial moment. Progress is, for me, is really, is really an evolution, is to be today aware of yesterday, even of the mistake, maybe, uh, from yesterday, ready to, to rediscuss and uh, find a fresh solution. Progress is, is a movement, to be open to all the new information, all the little shading that are, are moving around, and ready to take on board and, and move from there. Well, thank you, Simona Falcinella. So you can see Washburn is lived in all areas and also in procurement. I mean, this is, this is a tough topic, isn't it? But is it also fun for you if you realize you're making headway? Definitely, definitely. I mean, our heart goes into this, and I can't imagine anything better than having to address sustainability day by day. I love it. And, and also have this as my, well, job mission, and also to make the world a little better with the supply chain. And also to thrill your suppliers with this topic. If you notice they're pulling their weight, then, of course, I mean, the supply chain has become and can become green. Definitely, certainly. And, of course, the next 10 years, sustainability, sustainability will be a feature that will set us apart part for our customers and from our competition and we want to provide this to the customers who want that but of course to this end we need the suppliers but it's getting easier and easier as we speak day by day because you see more and more suppliers chipping in and I mean we have to train them or even well drill deeper with them but it's fun I can tell you it's very enjoyable well thanks Marco Filippi any questions you may have on the supply chain or on the greenification in the procurement. Send them in. But now we'll look at the next issue, and we'll look at environment protection here in production in the plant, next door to us. For over 35 years now, I have the honor of working for this company ever since I graduated and have various sites and with ever new challenges. Climate change is just one of these challenges for the production, but we are approaching it consistently, saving resources, producing sustainably and decarbonizing comprehensively. This is how we make our sites ready for the future. And this is how we bring the entire brand ahead. Because we at Audi are convinced, getting ahead is not just a technological or economic progress, getting ahead also is ecological and social progress. Our guiding motive is called Mission Zero. And that is heading, we have defined ambitious targets for my entire business division. But the most important one is that by 2025, we want to have a production sites carbon neutral on balance. But environmental protection is more than that. For example, resource efficiency, water utilization, or biodiversity. These fields of action of our Mission Zero will be outlined to you in due detail by Achim Dielmann and Rüdiger Recknagel now. By the way, sustainable action has been important to me for many, many years. Already in 2012, when I was plant manager in Ingolstadt, I bought green electric power. As one of the first one in the industry, but also out of conviction. Ever since, we've come a long way. With Brussels and Gür, we already have two sites that are completely carbon neutral on balance. San Jose Chapa is already wastewater free, and an example in kind when it comes to biodiversity is our production in Münzmünchde here close to Ingolstadt. So, you will notice, I can really get enthusiastic about this. Well, this is a good moment to hand over the floor to the live chat with my colleagues Dielmann and Recknagel. They will impress you quite sustainably, deputizing for the entire team. I'm convinced of that. 
Well, thank you, Peter Kössler. Now that's the case. We've got the two here with us. Achim Dielmann, he's the one who signs responsible for Mission Zero here at the sites. Howdy, and Rudiger Recknagel, our Chief Environmental Officer, and also the Managing Director of the Audi Environmental Foundation. And now I can imagine that many of our international viewers here will have heard for the first time that we actually have an environmental foundation at Audi. So, Rüdiger, tell us a little more about it. Well, you're quite right, Wolfgang. It's 12 years ago now that we made a very stiff and strict commitment for the environment by setting that environmental foundation into life. It's a no-profit organization, so available for everybody. Everybody can see what we do. It's fully transparent. Anybody can chip in. And we've defined three fields of action. First of all, green innovation, which means we use technology how we can do for the environment, secondly, responsibility, and thirdly, excitement. We want to excite people for environmental issues, and that's why we've got a huge network with the world of science, with the world of research, with the world of politics, and the young people who've got ideas for new technologies that can bring environment protection forward. They shall be fostered by us and by our fostering of these projects by forwarding the Audi DNA Vorsprung so, the CEO, And how does it work? I mean, you, you say this X, Y, and Z you do and you're independent? Yes, we are fully independent of Audi. As I said, we are no profit organization. Everything we do is available for everybody. Everybody can come on board. And our projects are also open to everybody. And of course, everybody can file in and join in. Okay, so you work is also for the outside, but you want to make sure that, of course, environment protection is also important for Audi, for the 90,000 colleagues worldwide. How do you ensure that? Well, of course, it's important that we live environment protection inside the company. And two and a half years ago, we set up our Mission Zero environmental program. And that bundles all the activities in production and logistics at all our various sites through this program. And the program goes well beyond each individual unit, so everybody is on board. And I think we're glad that we've also addressed all hierarchic levels from the Board of Management right down to the assembly worker. So just as a brief summary, we're speaking here about what is it, decarbonization, but at the end also resource saving, water saving, biodiversity that Rüdiger and the Environmental Foundation are looking at. But of course, as we heard earlier in that clip, that we already have implemented quite a bit here in this work. A number of our sites are already well advanced when it comes to these four fields of action, namely Audi Brussels, as we heard, since 2018 is already on balance CO2 neutral. Absolutely. Since 2018, Audi Brussels is CO2 neutral. We've achieved this with a bundle of measures, saving energy, secondly, using and generating green energy. We've got the biggest photovoltaic plant around Brussels on site, anywhere in Belgium actually, and then we also bought CO2 neutral thermal heat, which we do with natural gas, and only the remaining 5% is offset with carbon credits. But of course, because it's so complex, we have our own project manager for the site, and that's Achim Dielmann, who's been overseeing the Mission Zero project for the last two and a half years. Good, Achim. I mean, this is what it's all about, that our electric vehicles will already be produced as CO2 neutral as possible before the customer takes hold of them. And this can only be done if our sites are using CO2 neutral energy, are saving their water and the other resources. Well, yes, quite right. What Rüdiger just said there, that's like the blueprint for all sites of Audi. We need to make sure that energy consumption comes down, that we increase energy efficiency. We also make sure that we can produce energy wherever possible by ourselves in-house. And then whenever we buy energy, we want to buy it CO2 neutral. And then, of course, if not possible, in the end, we offset it with carbon credits. Now, what's special is, we've got, got regional differences. I mean, for example, we use biogas, natural gas, at our site in the Berlinger Höfe, where we've got our CHP plant, where we can, can generate heat, CO2 neutral. But of course, if you take our site in Gür in Hungary, here we can use geothermal energy, which means free of charge energy coming out of the depth of the earth, then we will favor that kind of approach. Okay, so we understood we can save plenty of energy by drawing resources from outside, by water and energy. But what about production on the production side? Can we also save resources within production? Oh, definitely. We've got a few interesting examples here how we can actually be more resource efficient in production. And I've got one 
one here with me, and that's the recycling of packaging material and the usage that is afforded to us with the 3D printers. That means we've got a very specific polymer that we clear and structure, and with that, we then produce a kind of a filament that we can use for the 3D printers. And from that, we, for example, make jigs and templates for the assembly that are then made available to the guys on the assembly line to then, for example, well, have, as I said, these templates used on the vehicles produced on the assembly line. Well, we heard it earlier already from Peter Kessler, a board member responsible for production, who referred to the plant in Mexico, where we are no longer using fresh water. We are constantly reusing, recycling the water. How about water usage at other sites? Well, of course, we do use a little of water because we've got, well, uh, um, water, of course, evaporating a little in that heat of Mexico. But everything else is in a cycle, in a closed loop. That's true. And we're working at every plant to have that same closed loop active. In Ecosun, for example, we've got a pilot phase and project undergoing right now where we're taking the wastewater discharge in which we also feed our wastewater that is reprocessed, cleaned, purified by our means, for our purposes, before it's refed into the plant. And with that, we can reduce almost 70% of our fresh water intake. Something similar is done as of next year in our site in Brussels and at the site here in Ingolstadt, where we have since 2019 a plant operative where we are reusing water so that about 50% of the water that would normally be cured as wastewater can be reused internally in the plant. Now, it works a lot with technological means, but Rüdiger, what other actions can you provide over the course of the year? Well, with the foundation, the Environmental Foundation, we are active foster of new technologies, i.e technology for a uh, future worth living in, which means you protect trees, you, you make sure there's still bees out and about on biodiversity likes. Indeed, we've got a pretty broad gambit and we've got plenty of colleagues on board working with us, like for example, tree plantation events or beehives are being positioned at new sites where you can even get money, support, financial support for such non-profit activities. Now, of course, you've got plenty of ideas that you work on, but at the end of the day, it's, I mean, it's like in, in Audi's think tank. At the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, have you got concrete examples where you really have been able to introduce something new in like the public infrastructure where environmental protection really can be measured? Yes, of course. I mean, we use technical ideas for environmental protection. And if you look at scientific progress, take a look at our oak afforestations. In 2008, that's 12 years ago, we already planted 100,000 common oaks at all our production facilities. I'm not with the aim of tying and obtaining CO2, no, but I actually do research, science and research here, which we do together, scientific research, with the Technical University of Munich. We plant these trees at different distances, what's called the mathematical density calculations to see how does that help biodiversity, but what's the growth and what's the earnings, so to say, of these oaks. And that is a scientific project. And here I think we do justice to our responsible, to our social responsibility and also to foster educational programs. Now, have you got other examples where you work and collaborate with partners like universities, cities, nations? Yes, I have another good technical example I'd like to outline, and that is our road sewage filters. So water running off the roads, normally, of course, soiled with dust, with, with tire wear off and the likes. And here we've got a project with the Technical University of Berlin. That means the Technical University of Berlin is developing filters. It's actually it's a whole filter system. It's a massive filter system, a filter system that allows us to retain soiling in the water. It's made up of nine different components. And what's important, we also link this with the weather forecast data, which means road cleaning and weather forecast is all metered and factored in. So before they come and clean the road, we make sure that the water is clean before it reaches the filters. Early we spoke with Oliver Hoffman about second life for batteries. Now, this is something I'm sure you will also be interested in. What do we do with batteries that have run their course in the car or their full life cycle? So what is the Audi Environmental Foundation thinking about reuse of batteries? Good question, Wolfgang. We're also developing ideas here, and we've got a startup in India called Nunam who use these batteries for second life. They take old batteries here, first from laptops, for example, 
actually assemble them in what they call these solar boxes, so little boxes that, as you can see, it can be powered by sunlight. And, yeah, for example, you've got, well, route lightning for street merchants. Or, as Oliver Hoffman said, we do so also for Audi. We've got two e-tron batteries as test batteries from test vehicles. Just check, again, in India, to have an entire, what we call, a nano grid. So a whole street of street merchants can be illuminated. And here we can see, well, over 60% of remaining energy can be still stored in these batteries. It's a vitally important project because it shows us how we, with the foundation, can really drive technology forward that we call green innovation. Well, thanks, Rüdiger, and thanks, Achim. We'll see you in a second in the Q&A session where we look forward to hear from you, from you and your questions. It's just a few days left until the International Automotive Trade Show will open here in Munich. Well, of course, you're cordially invited to visit that. But if you don't have the means, right now is the possibility to talk and engage with us. We're here for you. Send us your questions via the chat function in the microsite, and then we can get started in a few seconds. Hello and herzlich willkommen Welcome zum vorletzten Tag der Audi Media Days Future Audi Ready. Media Days. Heute im Spotlight Corporate Culture. Und damit auch die Frage, wie Audi konkret die Menschen nimmt, mitnimmt auf dem Weg Richtung Zukunft. Orientierung gibt, Unsicherheit nimmt, Bereitschaft weckt. Das wollen wir alles heute beantworten in zwei Teilen. Der erste Teil ist eine strategische Diskussion. We move people. Zwischen Praxis und Theorie. Zwischen Audis Personalvorstand Dr. Sabine, Dr. Sabine Maaßen und einem der führenden Organisationssoziologen von Deutschland, Professor Stefan Consultant, Kühl. Professor Stefan Kühl. The second part will see two experts from Audi telling us how HR transformation is done here at Audi. And then it's up to you. We have the possibility for you to send in questions to ask our experts. Please use our microsite tool and enter your questions. And please do so already during the talk. Thank you so much for being here. It's great to have you. See you soon. Everything around us is changing constantly. Change is simply a fact of life. There are a lot of things in motion here at Audi as well, because progress is only possible with change. Climate change, digitalization, new mobility needs. What are our answers to the big questions of the future? Progress is in our DNA. Our aim is to use Vorsprung durch Technik to advance not only cars, but also people, and as a consequence, to sustainably shape the mobility of tomorrow. We want to invite everyone to work actively and courageously for the future of Audi, to rethink things and see opportunities in the upcoming changes. Our goal is to provide all Audi employees with a secure framework that allows for freedom to be lived. And with that, our aim is for us all to take responsibility for our actions, for society and for our environment. I am convinced, together, we can seize the opportunities of this transformation and determine the future of mobility. Right, so we saw in that video, Audi is on the move at the moment. Now we have two people here who know how change works. We have Sabine Maaßen and Stefan Kühl. Welcome here in our glass cube on the Audi Piazza in Ingolstadt. Ms. Maaßen, we'll start with you. Vorsprung durch Technik is and will remain the core of the Audi brand, but it's rethought. What does that mean for the people? Well, I believe we all know that this is the largest transformation in the corporate history 
for the history of Audi. Our environment is changing, but also the needs of our customers. And that means the needs of our employees are changing automatically. And we are actively shaping that transformation. We know the future of Audi will be electric and it will be digital. And that gives us and our employees and our colleagues a sense of direction. Within that framework, we're doing our HR transformation. So we're interlinking our strategy, Vorsprung 2030, with our HR transformation. And to me, one thing is very important. We're doing it with our people because our employees are making Audi and they're setting us apart. I can tell that this is really close to your heart. How do you move people? Well, we decided to do this transformation from the inside outside. We want to use that transformation. We want to keep our employees. We're proud of them and we are confident that this is a path that we can go down together. That's a message that's very important for our employees as well. Transformation is not a once in a lifetime event. We all know that transformation and change is a constant in this ever-changing world. So to us, it's very important to create structures that mean that transformation is not an individual event, but that we create a structure and an environment where our colleagues can re-experience and continuously see that transformation. That's our goal. Thank you very much, Ms. Maaßen. Mr. Kuhl, before we start with the concrete transformation, you come from a research perspective. You look at organizations and structures. Can you tell us how does the structure and cultural change work in an environment? Well, the interesting thing really is how does an organization structure change? There's an approach that says, we have to establish a new mission statement. Now, that's certainly not harmful, but one knows from academic research pretty exactly that these mission statements by themselves do not yet generate a cultural change. Now, the interesting thing when changing organization to a corporate culture is that the real lever is in the formal structure, that is, in the way and manner, of example, the reporting an organization looks like. You can work with a matrix or with a functional organization, the reward systems or how certain processes are set up, which means you have to really think outside the box if you want to change an organizational structure. Then you approach the change of the formal structure, and with that you can have a cultural change in the organization. Well, Ms. Maaßen, what's your take on this? Now, I'm convinced transformation won't work with just a call to action, if you want to call it that. I'm sure we need structure in order to transform, but both needs to work together, it needs to be interlinked, it needs to be lived. Structure alone isn't enough, but it won't work without the structure. But this is a path that we will have to find together. I don't really want to call it a call to action. Rather, our clear communication of a goal, the structure, the corresponding structure, that goes together. And I, could, I couldn't agree more. Structure is a decisive factor. Well, what's the role of HR here in this transformation? What's your team's approach? You know, it's a new for task for us too. What is so complex about this HR transformation? We are reducing, remodeling and rebuilding at the same time. This is very com complex and we've never had that before in our work structures. That means for us that we've changed our work structures accordingly. We've worked closely with our departments. We needed to know first, what do you need in the future? We also had a large transparency phase. We divided all of our employees up into different job clusters. We wanted to create transparency. We wanted to know where are we at the moment. And then we wanted to start with our new structures and go into the transformation. And as always, we're doing it with our business units. It will only work if we work together. It's not just HR or singular business units. We're doing it together. Co-determination is key at Audi. It's a part of our culture, and that's good. This will also help us to work together in these new structures. Co-determination is a key part, and it's part of our structure. So together is really the buzzword. But of course, HR is controlling the transformation. What's the role of Audi Zukunft here? Now, Audi Zukunft is a contractual foundation that provides a frame for our future. First and foremost, we have a job guarantee in Audi Zukunft up until 2029. 
That is a frame, a time frame that we believe provides security. And I am convinced that we need that framework because change is always uncertainty for the individual. It means you need to venture down new paths and you need a framework for that. But it's not just about securing jobs. It also gives us that path forward to do some more qualification. We have principles. We're looking internal, internally. What can we do to qualify employees? But we'll also look externally. But as said, it's reduce, remodel, rebuild. That's complex, and we're going to have to do that. Mr. Ku, Ms. Maasen just said transformation is done together. But just because a decision has been done together doesn't mean everybody's happy. Well, look, I think that it's not a single change process, no single transformation process where everybody's well jubilant and enthusiastic. I'd say a process where everybody is happy about is no real change process. Meaning opposition, doubts and, and questions are automatically part and parcel of a transformation process. I think what's important here is that you have like that job guarantee that gives you the possibility to abstract away from your personal cares and fears. And of course, I mean, if you know you've got eight or nine years safety in your job, then, of course, you can think about a change process in a way to say, is this actually something that fits the work way I want to have and how organization makes sense? And then, of course, opposition and queries are key information that you need in a transformation process that will also then, in a way, optimize the organization. So I would assume, first and foremost, that if there's opposition, if there's doubt, if there's question, that's material with which you can work in such a transformation process. Well, Ms. Maasen, how do you do it? How do you get everybody on board? How do you deal with conflicts and uncertainties? You know, I couldn't agree more. It won't work without conflicts. And these conflicts need to be addressable. We need to find a way to solve them and solve them without ending up with winners and losers. We need to face up to the fact that conflicts are part of the process. It's important to see how we're solving them. And at Audi, we want to do that aligned with our values. I believe our management has an incredibly important role because they are the ones leading our employees through that transformation. I'm convinced. If we have employees that are confident in our path, solving conflicts will work differently. Confidence is key. Confidence cuts down complexity. And as said, I'm absolutely convinced our Audi colleagues is confident about our strategy. They're confident about the path. Well, let's look at the employee's perspective once again. Can you give us a few examples? Where do we have individual freedom and where does the company take over? Well, let me get back to that point. What kind of structures did we create in order to enable transformation? Let me give you two examples. We created a landing page, and that landing page will go online next month. And let me compare it to buying a car. A customer will have a customer experience there. And we want to create a transformation experience for every employee. So on that landing page, we have the transformation process mapped up, just like an underground. And I can click on that map. I can say, well, I want to change. Who can I turn to? What can I do? How do I communicate properly? What are my opportunities? What's the overall process? That's something we're going to describe very transparently. And of course, we have an underground line for our leaders as well because we asked them to lead quite differently through that transformation. And that differs from leading 10 to 15 years ago. That's one example of a structure that we created to give our employees an experience. And then it really comes down to it. It is now about how does the individual employee experience that transformation. And of course, change always comes with apprehension. So we need to wonder, what can I do to support our employees through that process? So it's kind of like a personal trainer when you start a new sport, somebody who's there by your side, step by step. We started the first pilot. We have job coaches in the field now. And according to the job clusters, not one-to-one, -one, but according to different groups, they will support employees through that path, through that process. They are there for conflicts, which will happen 
inevitably and also through apprehension. To me, one thing is very important. This transformation is a pulling system, if you will. Sending somebody on their way means I need to know where they should end up. And we want to have the destination laid out for everyone who's setting out to change. We actually have to do that because Otherwise, we can't qualify accordingly. And these are just two examples that we have, two pilots that we started. They will go live soon. And we, I have to say we had great feedback during the pilots from our employees. Well, I can imagine, I'm sure that really eases apprehension. Now, people hear transformation and then they feel reducing lurking. What's the situation at Audi? Well, transformation is always about reducing, remodeling and rebuilding. These, is, this is a framework we have with Audi Zukunft. We are on a clear path. We believe we are now in the remodeling phase and we're basically done with reducing. Remodeling and rebuilding, those are the key activities for the coming years. Mr. Kühl, what's your take on this? What do you think? When is transformation a success? Many set out to change, many fail. How would you define success? Well, I think the critical moment is once HR measures are linked with other change measures in the organization. So to what extent do we succeed in linking the change of a business unit with certain measures in the HR? unit. How does a change in the organizational chart, and I mean speaking of a matrix to a functional organization, how is that tied together with personnel measures or reward systems or certain processes that are set up? How closely are they tied and linked to the HR unit? And I think the interesting thing with Audi is you can see how this interlinking is happening. And I believe this is one of the most critical moments or should we say success factors to actually really generate a sustainable change process in the company. Yeah. Ms. Maaßen, one last question to you. How confident are you in thinking that this transformation will be a success? You know, I'm certain it will be. On the one hand, we have our framework, Audi Zukunft, but also we are part of a group and that gives us competitive edge. We have a whole host of different brands. We have a variety of people all around the globe. We are really part of this small universe that provides impulses for us and that really helps down this path of transformation. And then there's something that I've experienced, the Audi spirit. The people here at Audi live their brand. They make this company, they make this brand, and I am absolutely confident that we will be successful. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Maaßen, Mr. Kuhl. Thank you so much for being here. So we saw the automotive industry is changing, Audi's culture is changing, but the decisive factor that remains important, that's the people. We'll be back with the second part of Corporate Culture. See you in a few seconds. Enthusiasm is important for our progress in finding innovative and super creative solutions. And that's exactly what we need. I've now become acquainted with many areas here at Audi because I've been with the company for a really long time. I consider myself an open-minded person, a curious person, which means I'm also a person who wants to learn, wants to experience new things. For me, curiosity means a thirst for knowledge, the desire to always explore something new, to evolve, to be interested in other topics, even outside your own field of activity. Always learn new things that you didn't know before. We can only be a step ahead of others and generate an edge if we are brave enough to dare to do something someone else hasn't done yet. Or to try something new that we haven't had experience with. When I change a structure, I change a culture. This enables us to increase the speed of development processes or projects in the company. There are many positive examples where the so-called speak-up culture is truly lived, in cases where you're not sure about your actions, where you can approach your superiors at any time and also involve your colleagues. And there's a desire for addressing topics. And from my point of view, that's the key to a successful company. This desire that we change, that's something I can fully identify with. And that just gives me motivation on the job all over again. Developing within this framework and providing the input we need 
is what we actually want to promote, that each and every one of us, each and every employee, becomes aware that we are all in a position to make our contribution to the corporate strategy, and also that we can help to shape that strategy. Well, everyone, welcome back to the second part of our Spotlight Corporate Culture. We are ready to innovate the future. In the discussion, we just heard the strategic direction is clear for the HR transformation at Audi. Now, we're really going down to detail. We have two experts here who will tell us how Audi is implementing the structure. Jan Michel is Chief Transition Architect in Technical Development at Audi. And we have Mark oliver Schell. He is in charge of implementing Audi Zukunft. It's the transformation program, the HR program. It's great to have you here. Let's do a reality check. Jan Michel, you are a transition architect. How do you make sure that technical development remains an innovation driver? Well, first of all, the R&D department at Audi, that's 10,000 highly motivated colleagues who daily work to bring our ideas to innovations that customers can experience. Now, with the change in the automotive industry, because we're talking about new drive train technology, we're talking about highly automated driving digital business models, you notice that innovation really needs to be much broader, much more varied. But with that, of course, also increases complexity. Now, with the group strategy, we now have a clear orientation. It defines, for example, if you take a look at the last combustion engine, the what and the when. And with that, we can also be very pinpointed and targeted in order to start this competence transformation. So a competence transformation by itself is not what it is. We also need to work in structures and processes. In the R&D department, we all summarize all of this under the term systems engineering. That's what we're introducing. Thank you so much, Jan. Mark Oliver, you are in the HR department and you're in charge of implementing Audi Zukunft. We just heard a bit about the program from Sabine Maaßen. Maybe you can summarize. What do you do? What are your steps? Indeed. Well, it's three steps we're taking. In the first step, we have a so-called target picture defined for all business divisions in units, for example, also for R&D. Now, what is such a target picture? Well, we deduce it from the strategy. And that's so important that we know exactly where we're headed. From that, we deduce what kind of changes will that mean for personnel requirements? Which means in which areas do we have an extra demand and in which areas do we have a lower requirement and demand? That brings us to the second step, our so-called strategic workforce planning. Now, we're really looking at the competencies that Jan just mentioned. Competencies are changing. To this, we use so-called job clusters, of which we have around 150 in R&D. And, I mean, for example, there's an engineer to look at the mechanics or an employee for virtual development. Now, these job clusters describe the necessary competences and expertise in order to execute the necessary work. In the second step, we then break down the extra or lesser demands of and for HR on these job clusters and know then what personal movements are necessary. Brings me to the third step. Here is all about the implementation of the HR measures. That means, how do we move people from those areas that in future will have a lower need into the areas fit for the future. I mean, we've just heard a few key words here, autonomous driving, electric mobility and the likes. And here we define the qualifications. For example, our qualification program on software, such an example in case. We do that together with the Technical University in English, where we move people towards the future fields, implement this, and also check up how far are we ahead with the transformation. That sounds like a very complex task and a lot of movement. So many analyses, so many formal approaches. Is there still room for being human? Well, I would say the analysis and this transparency, that's important, that we have an orientation. And I always say, I mean, it's, it's like our transformation roadmap that really provides you with the route we're headed. But of course, we also have to look at the individual colleagues and workforce. We have to see, is this a fit? Is this a fit on this route? Is that colleague willing to go along? And for this, we have what we call HR transformation teams that we established. Now, what is that? Well, these transformation teams are made up of colleagues from management, for example, from development, colleagues from HR, from various divisions, and representatives from Woodworks Council. Because to look at the job specifications, which employees ready and fit for that change, and how can we assist them, how can we qualify them, this is something we can only do together. And we do that exactly in these teams. They look very closely which employee groups need to be moved. Do we want to move, for example, as we heard, in the areas system 
System Engineering, Functional Development. Thank you so much, Mark Oliver. Jan, now you're here from technical development. Can you give us a few examples? Or maybe just tell us a bit from the kitchen cabinet. How does sure, implementation work? I mean, I already just mentioned it, systems engineering. That really means that we have to think completely anew about a car development. It means so far we've been very focused on components, how we set up the car. But we need to think more on systems. Systems, the components, the functions, they all are interlinked and connected, which means we don't need just have a hardware level, a mechanical level, but we now also have the software level that needs to be integrated that will increase. That means nothing else that we have to develop a car completely anew as we have done it in the past. I'd like to give you three examples on three different levels. In the structure, we need to move away from functional silos towards a matrix organization where we really are connected, bringing things together, right on the lowest rung and level. That's in the real development. Then, on the process level, we're really going into the nitty-gritty. That means that's the product generation process. Our PEP needs to be completely arranged. So far, we only looked at a discrete event. That's the market launch. That's the SOP. Every seven years in a cycle. But the customer now expects updates over the air and he expects them almost in a weekly rhythm, which means we need to continually further develop the vehicle, our products, and then break it down into modules. Secondly, we have the competency level. I mean, Mark Oliver, you've just mentioned it there. We also need to work on the qualifications. We've got countless programs, for example, here with electric mobility, with high voltage battery systems, or with autonomous driving. We work with universities and other external institutes in order to secure qualification and also partly certification. Now, this isn't something you can do as a quick fix, but we're talking about monthly programs, some that even run over years, but it's an investment in the competencies of the future for the technical development. So there's a lot changing on the formal, on the structural level. What about the culture? Can you give us a few examples from technical development? How does the culture change as a reaction to the transformation? Uh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. In the last nine to ten months, we've seen an enormous speed picking up. We've got an organization set up that's completely rejigged in the R&D. We've got model lines that have been cut along the electronic architecture. We've got a new chief engineer organization introduced, which exactly translates this project view into a line view. We have looked at the technical development lines and have consolidated them according to the systems engineering approach. So a lot has happened in the organizational structure and, of course, also in the subsequent operational structure, which all of which creates a certain apprehension, insecurity, also personal fear years and apprehensions well, follow from this. And then we need to be very careful in listening and also noticing this. So we've got plenty of communication and interaction formats that above all have no time delay and always first hand. That means we need to talk with all the 10,000 engineers and developers and interact directly with them and work with them. And what we are doing as an assisting measure in this year is also a collaboration and a leadership image and to develop a corresponding culture. Because what we've just created here in a first step into a process organization in the setup organization also needs to be filled with life in the operational organization. And this can only be done if and when you have such leadership and collaboration models, train them and actually anchor them in your daily life. And that's still a journey ahead of us. It does sound like it. Mark Oliver, is there anything you'd like to add? But yes, I think plenty of change as we've seen. And with that, of course, if you only look at the organizational and operational structure, you have new competency needs, new roles. And therefore, I think it's so important that we really interlink, that we tooth these different activities. Because one activity alone is not enough. A personal transformation by itself won't work. It needs to be combined with a target picture, with translation process, with a strategy, with structural change that we have in order to get a holistic image. And I think that's also the job that we get this right. This holds true not just for the R&D department, for technical development. No, this holds true for all of Audi. And we do that with the Audi Sukov program. And here we want to make sure that in future we can do this time and again, because we believe this change is something that will stay with us over the next few years. Well, thank you so much for this deep dive. It was really insightful. We know how Audi moves people. And now I would like to ask you and invite you to come forward with your questions. Please use the Microsite tool. I'll be happy to read your questions. Hello and 
welcome to this, the fifth and the final day of our Audi Media Days. Today, the focus is on the future of Audi and the presentation of our Grand Sphere concept vehicle. Before that, however, as I just said, we want to start out by speaking to our CEO, Mark Stusman, about the future of Audi. Afterwards, also as I just said, and ahead of the actual world premiere, we will then present to you the Audi Grand Sphere concept. Over the last few weeks, you already were able to see a few teasers, and today it's finally time to pull up the curtain. And at the end, Q&A session together with Marcus Dusman, and we also have Oliver Hoffman, our board member responsible for technical development, on board. Important note, all information relating to the concept car are still subject to an embargo, and the embargo ends on the 2nd of September, that's tomorrow at 7.30 standard European time. With that, let's just now review the last few days together, because I think we had many quite different and varied insights, and I believe we've given you a wide and varied overview. The following summarizes what has happened. And welcome to our Audi Media Days. Through our innovative strength, we want to offer people options for sustainable and climate neutral mobility. More than ever, we are asking ourselves today what the demand for mobility will be in 10 years' time. It is our task, our responsibility to anticipate this and take the right decisions now. We have the biggest transformation in the automotive history ahead of us. And it will only work if we tackle the issues in a very focused manner. And that's what we're doing. Decisions we're made today don't just affect us. They don't just affect the here and now. They affect future generations. Now, particularly important for us is the jointly support target image that clearly defines where we want to be in 2030. And to that end, we have set ourselves quite ambitious goals and targets that also give us a very clear orientation as to what we are concentrating on, what we are focusing on, and what we will no longer be doing in the future. We actually conceived this strategy with a different approach. We developed it purely in-house. That's something we had never done before. We've chosen to start this transformation internally. Vorsprung 2030, always with our people, because our colleagues, they shape Audi, and they are what's most important. We have to think holistically. Ultimately, there's also an attitude behind every innovation. It's not just about financial KPIs, but it's also about issues such as climate protection, environmental protection, ethical corporate governance, social action, compliance, integrity, culture, diversity, and so forth. Forschung is not just a matter of only technological economic progress. It's also ecologic and social progress. Our guiding principle is Mission Zero. Under this term, we have set ourselves in my business unit very ambitious targets. We have a chance now to rethink the car entirely. The automotive industry is currently experiencing the largest transformation in its history, and the key drivers are electrification and digitalization. We at Audi see it as an opportunity and want to position ourselves at the forefront of this change. With that, we're back, and now with me here is our CEO, Markus Dusman. Markus, welcome. Hello, Dirk, and also thank you from me. Now, in that clip, we just saw plenty of aspects, and I would like to summarize and say the transformation is in a good and speedy way. Absolutely, indeed, yes. And the change of speed, I mean, that we have and that we also have out there is enormous. And of course, we move and we keep moving the big issues like electrification, digitalization, and above all, of course, autonomous driving. And for these issues, we have very clear perspectives. Can you give us examples for these perspectives? Sure. One central aspect is, of course, Carrier as a software company for all brands within the Volkswagen Group. Or take our electro 
vehicle architecture of the PPE, or the next step, the SSP. Here, over the last few years, we've really defined the right framework. And at the same time, of course, it was for us on the Board of Management very important to have the entire strategic orientation of Audi further developed. Because the world out there has really moved on very quickly. Just look at the rules and regulations and the future CO2 limit values for our fleets. Or if you look at the social expectations, for our company, then it becomes pretty clear that's why we had to rejig our priorities and resharpen them. Now, with the strategy for 2030, you as Board of Management team define the next stage in the transformation. Now, over this overview of the last few days and at the end of the Audi Media Days, what are for you the most important points? Well, see, I think it's our job and our responsibility to make individual mobility carbon neutral and at the same time to retain the freedom of movement of people. That is a central question of our time and every car manufacturer must address it himself. And the media echo for our plan to well, leave the combustion engine world has been extremely positive. The public is clearly recognizing that we as Audi are really taking the step ahead. And the recently pronounced and published report of the World Climate Change has just made it very clear we have no choice but to bring down our carbon emissions in all industries. No. Moving on from the external perspective, let's have a look inside the company. What does that mean for the people within the company? Well, internally speaking, of course, that means that decision means it, it's a huge, it has a huge significance. I mean, people here who for many, many years have worked in certain jobs and areas asking themselves, what about the safety of their job and what will it look like in the future? And of course, here we also have been able to answer many such questions. On the one hand, you have a job guarantee all the way through to 2029. And of course, we have invested half a million euros for further training and qualification in the new fields of work. And at the same time, by the decision to leave the combustion engine world, we have clarity early on for the entire transformation of Audi. And that is a good thing. Clarity is always good. Now, the entire transformation, as I once said in an interview, that's probably the biggest transformation process in corporate history. So, I mean, we are really, well, got a few challenges ahead of us with it, no? Well, of course, there's, there's plenty of questions. That's a huge step for the company. But we've agreed that we will be very consistent in going down this track. And we've calculated and analyzed how we will be successful also in the future. I mean, the legal stipulations with the, United, the European Union has presented just before the summer break makes it very clear and confirms our route. And Brussels has also showed that it is following the ambitious targets of the car industry. And that's something, of course, that we're delighted in. Yeah, I think many would like to know and are interested because we had a number of questions on this in the last few weeks. What's the role, to your mind, that the combustion engine will play in the next few years? Well, obviously, um, the business with the combustion engines is something that will be an important earning driver in this decade. And let me say this quite clearly. Our last combustion engines, the ones that we were building, they will be the best we will have ever built. That's something I'm absolutely convinced. But parallel to the phase-out of the combustion engine, we are, of course, in our production federation network, readying ourselves for the switch to new and highly efficient and highly attractive electric models. How, how does that look like exactly? What do we need in order to achieve this idea, this vision of a carbon neutral mobility? Well, of course, our entire product lineup in all the core segments is consistently switched to electric mobility. Now, that's a huge change for our company. But I think it's an even bigger opportunity. I am personally absolutely convinced that we can master and solve the challenges of our time only with technological progress. The problems of the world need to be solved technologically. And as we as Audi are making a contribution by retaining the freedom of individual mobility and securing it for the people. Sustain Sustainability and individual mobility are no mutual exclusives. That's something that's evident from the electric cars. As a basic condition, we need a swifter expansion of renewable energies and an even faster expansion of the charging infrastructure. Now, charging infrastructure is a good word here because, of course, the federal government only a few weeks announced that they would actually lift and raise the subsidies for private charging possibilities. I mean, Warbucks and the likes. Is that enough? 
Well, subsidizing private households is absolutely meaningful and sensible, but also our public infrastructure needs to be ramped up and expanded quickly because the demand by customers for electric mobility is massive. In the first half year of this year alone, we have been able to deliver fully electric and plug-in hybrids in a number of 80,000 units delivered. That's more than twice as much as in the same period last year before. And I mean, next to the efforts of the policies, policy world, we want to make our contribution for the charging infrastructure. How can that look like? Have you got an example? Well, we'll soon start with the Audi charging hub. That's a super innovative pilot project. And with that, we're laying the groundwork that we can use lithium-ion batteries in a second life as a storage facility for electric power as an additional offer to the well, public grid. And that's something that's exclusive for our customers that they have booked and reserve. With this technology, we're offering another swift charging offer with up to 300 kilowatt performance without the existing public grid being strained any further. And with that, electric mobility as a whole becomes more attractive. And of course, we also need to think this very holistically, which our example shows. We need to look at the various use possibilities and customer requirements. And more than before, it's not just the car that's crucial here. It's the ecosystem all around the electric car. Shell does, if you look at perspective, cover everything. Charging, navigating, parking, paying services, predictive maintenance, and I'm sure even more to come. Now, with that, we've, we've addressed electric mobility. E-mobility, sustainability, digitalization, of course, are the big drivers, the big issues, not just for us, but in general. But I think there's a whole number of other further topics that you on the board addressed. Yes, obviously. By I mean, working out the strategy, we looked very exactly in which fields we expect to see growth and where Audi can position itself well. And to that, we've really took our strategic process and looked far ahead into the future and analyzed around 600 trends. From that, we deduced growth opportunities for Audi along the entire value creation chain and defined these in bundled central action fields. But up until 2030, we will now implement these aspects in a very targeted that fashion. Now, last week, when Silvia Pila and John were here with me, we had a number of questions on a strategy. They were predictable, of course, and they also was, was a bit circumnavigating them. But now today, I think we still have to address them in full detail. Otherwise, in the Q&A session, well, you get them anyway. But with a comprehensive strategy, you always also define strategic objectives, targets, goals, clear targets that also define a direction, even if they have not been thrashed out in the individual little nitty-gritty elements. But they give a clear direction. What are they with the strategy Forschung 2030? Now, very important, Forschung 2030 is really all geared towards growth, both quantitative as well as qualitative growth. That means in detail that by the year 2030, we want to sell 3 million Audis per year. That's around 50% more than we do right now. That's very ambitious, but with a view on market projections and our attractive product lineup, it's absolutely doable from our mind and perspective. At the same time, profitability is crucial. In the last quarters, Audi has proven what quality it can provide and that we can achieve high rates of return within our strategic corridors that's anywhere between 9 and 11 percent. With increasing group synergies, a long term sustainable rate of return of 11 percent, to our mind, is realistic. I promise you we'll get questions on that later in the QA session. When it comes to corporate success, Success. I mean, that was something that in the past was above all driven by innovations. Or if we go even further back, I mean, look at Quattro or currently our light innovations. What, what, what have you got up your sleeve there? What's coming more? I mean, sure. I mean, innovations are and remain the key success factor for Audi. We've got plenty of good ideas, and in the past maybe have found it a bit hard to have them systematically implemented already in the early development phase and to define them in a combining and convincing manner. And therefore we need no robust processes that innovations reach our customers quicker and faster. I'm glad that with Oliver Hoffman we now have a board of management member responsible for technical development with a clear vision for Forschung und Technik. He's driving the rejigment of the technical development department flat out and very successfully. Okay, we've already spoken about Oli now. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear him in person. And therefore, let's switch over directly to the tech development department where he is personally telling something about the transformation of that business unit. Let's roll the clip. Is 
I do see myself to be a very creative person. And I think Move On Maker is a good fit for me. I'm a team player. The idea is the creative potential of our development team. To bring that to the fore and that that becomes experienceable in our car. That's my job. We're here in the technical development department where we drive the innovations of tomorrow. The future of mobility is fully electric, connected, highly digital, and above all, it is seamless. Our customers will experience their Audis in their everyday life. Now, vehicle development has changed significantly. In the past, the vehicle was the sum total of all its components, and today we are thinking in software-based systems. So to that extent, it requires a completely new development stage in the 21st century. The brown has always fascinated me. The curiosity for the new, questioning things, to really shifting limits and borders, to remain curious, to try out new things, that really connects me with Audi. Ideas are born in the minds and brains of our 10,000 developers. If I look into my schedule in the morning and I can see there's an approval drive for a test project, I can tell you that is great fun. And I am a huge fan of motorsports and I love going to the racetrack where I really give it my all. In motorsport, you will only win if you bring it as a team effort. If they all work together, if every detail is a fit. Now for us, Vorsprung der Technik is not just a claim. Vorsprung der Technik is an attitude and it's a promise to our customers. Audi is a design brand and the light technology is a key component of our Audi design DNA. We develop light technology consistently further and really get away from pure visibility towards communication. The Audi DNA project means we are clearly outlining how Audi will look like in the future, but also how it will feel and how it drives. It goes far beyond over the features that we've known and been able to measure so far. Lateral acceleration, longitudinal acceleration, steering feel. It goes really all the way to highly automated driving. Now, highly automated driving for me is a game changer in the automotive industry. We are developing a project with Artemis and a vehicle that is consistently geared towards the use case level four, that is highly automated driving. We will bring that car to the customer in 2025. We can live Vorsprung only as a team, and that is extremely important to me, that everyone ships in for one another. This is how we at Audi develop vehicles. Well, thank you, Oliver Hoffmann. Ladies and gentlemen, at the start of August, we had the Audi Sky Sphere as the first member of a new family of concept cars, three in total. Today, now, finally, the second member of the family, the Audi Grand Sphere concept, which is our vision of the future in the luxury segment. And next year, then, we will round out that family of three with the Audi Urban Sphere. Before we do so, I hand over, and, well, already ahead of the world premiere, here is the premiere of the Audi Grand Sphere.
Wir bei Audi. We at Audi, we are shaping the mobile future. With Quattro, lightweight construction, light technology and electromobility. And next, with automated vehicles. This is changing the way we travel and it also changes our vehicles from ground up. Automated driving will be a whole new form of mobility for our customers. And today, we are showing our vision. The Audi Grand Sphere concept. We developed the first ideas for this back in 2017. In the Icon and IME of Vision Vehicles. The Grand Sphere concept is the anticipation of the first product from the Artemis project already closer to series production. Automated driving at level 4 is a core component of its layout. The interior becomes a living environment. Freedom is for me the central term here. We're working on variable seating positions, operation via voice control, touch screens and gesture control. Everything is being integrated into a digital ecosystem. So the car can be an office or a movie theater, or for shopping and gaming, or just relaxation, like at home. We develop cars in line with the needs of our customers and society. The Audi Grand Sphere concept is, of course, an electric vehicle. It is based on the premium platform electric. And the PPE is the basis for the coming generations of our mid and luxury class cars. The Grand Sphere concept has one electric motor on the front and one at the rear axle. Power output is 530 kilowatts at 960 newton meters of torque. Its range of more than 750 kilometers according to WLTP is equivalent to that of a true touring sedan. Its battery has a capacity of 120 kilowatt hours. Thanks to the 800 volt technology, it can be charged at up to 270 kilowatts. So in just 10 minutes, it can hold enough power for over 300 kilometers range. The Audi Grand Sphere concept marks our path to the top of the competition as a pace setter for progress in mobility. Well, thank you, Oli, for that presentation. We're back again with you, Max Dusman. Well, thanks to the entire team. Our design team around Mark Lichter has done another great and outstanding job, I think. The Grand Sphere is a good example how technologies can be used in the best possible way in order to meet the needs of our customers and put them center stage. Now, this concept gives us an outlook onto the, well, nearer future, meaning the second half of the coming decade. But what's concretely ahead of us in the next few weeks and months? Well, of course, I mean, the further operational thrashing out of our strategy and the clear decision for a clear phase-out date from the combustion engine world, the transformation that can really pick up speed. It's not just a technological transformation, though, isn't it? It's also a change that internally can be felt and affects the entire corporation, the structures, the processes are changing. So what's the role that Audi Zukunft is playing? That principal agreement between the company and the Works Council representatives, because it also has to do with the job guarantee until 2029, right? Indeed. I'm very glad and grateful that with that agreement on the Audi Zukunft, we have laid the groundwork for the necessary personal adjustments to you. And part of it is, of course, the already mentioned job guarantee all the way through to 2029. And with it, we offer all the colleagues from all the departments, from procurement, production, and the likes, a well-established qualification for the training program so that they can be trained to the new challenge 
challenges and tasks. And this was particularly true for the fields of digitalization and electric mobility. And of course, we also want to make our plants more efficiently utilized in the future. So the strategy is now broken down onto regions, sites, and years. And in November, we're heading into the new planning round, and of course, that next planning round will be harmonized across the various brands. Oh, the group, speaking of which, is a good work. In July, our Volkswagen Group presented a new strategy called New Auto. What's the role Audi is playing in that strategy? Well, we will and we want to collaborate with the Volkswagen Group and the other brands and be a leading player in the world of mobility. Because the current transformation process shows that massive investments are necessary. Necessary and well, we're not actually able for individual brands to master. For some competitors, this will become a matter of survival. And here, of course, we are glad to be part and parcel of that strong group, Volkswagen Group. And with New Auto, the group has really sharpened its priorities and thus supports the successful transformation of our strategy, Forschung 2030. And the bundled strength of the Volkswagen Group is our key competitive edge in the transformation towards electric mobility and, of course, also software. Now here, of course, we are definitely benefiting in central areas from, from the, the, the group internal collaboration in Volkswagen Group and therefore also the synergies that we can live. I mean, we spoke with Jürgen last week about this, but from your perspective, what what are the key elements of these synergies? Well, first of all, look at electric mobility. That's where you need to make the biggest investments. And with the SSP, we as a Volkswagen Group are providing a unified architecture for the entire product lineup. Fully electric, digital, and highly scalable, from small cars all the way up to our biggest cars. And as of 2026, production of pure electric vehicles will be based on this architecture. And in our Artemis project, you have selected modules of the SSP speed, like the unified cell, being deployed early on and for the first time. And I just said, with Jürgen, we looked at this whole topic um, from well, platform strategy as a key competitive advantage. And here we also looked at the aspect of software and operating system. A lot is happening there as well, no? Well, the software stack 2.0 of Carriot will be a unified operating system for the vehicles of all group brands. And another feature of this E to the power 3 2.0 will be the level 4 ability. That means the highly automated driving. That paves the way for a new digital ecosystem and thus also for data-based business models. Software thus will become the lever for synergies and innovations of the future. And the success of Carriot is thus for us as a group, as Volkswagen Group, of central significance, meaning the group is providing the framework, or should we say the, the groundwork, the basis for the individual brands with the individual directions. Yes, sure, I mean, exactly. I mean, the clear differentiation of strong brands is a central element of the Volkswagen Group strategy. And Audi is making, with this clear strategy, an important contribution to the success of the group strategy. Porsche 2030 defines the role of Audi as a premium brand and strengthens our own premium positioning and puts the focus on profitable growth in new business fields. Well, that's also why the Audi DNA will be playing a much more central role in the future. Indeed, exactly. And Oliver Hoffman has initiated that project. We call it Audi DNA because our claim must be that an Audi always feels like an Audi, even if the driver, perspectively, becomes a passenger. And therefore, we will strengthen our product identity once more. That holds true for our cars, for all products, all services that we will offer. And with that, of course, the four rings continue to stand by and be a byword for unmistakable premium experiences. And of course, we hold true to our brand and promise Vorsprung of Technik on many, many areas. Thanks. That sounds like a good wrap-up, Marcus. Thank you for that. And you will, of course, be with us in a second in the Q&A session when Oliver Hoffman will join us as well. And to this end, give us a few moments to rejig so that we all can come back here in the studio and we'll see you in a few seconds. See you then.